Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, and so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show. Booyah! It's Monday, May 1st. We made it. This We're a week away from our one year anniversary. A week and a day. May 9th, yeah, yeah. How about that? That's crazy. And we, the we, critics said we wouldn't last. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of here. You're done. It's Did you still cold and rainy. Everybody enjoyed draft weekend? Yeah, it was long, man. It was long. Man, draft weekend, they be, I mean, when you rehash the pick so many times, it's just like. I know. You just There's keep only so going. much you can say about these Yeah, guys. it's just like, I, I guess. Was this I, the most uneventful Browns draft in recent memory? Well, it was so uneventful, uneventful for me. I spent it in Buffalo on a World War II Navy ship with my son wow. on a scouts <laughs> overnight. Dang, bro. I have never seen beds stack so high. They were four, sta- like, really? there was this much room between the beds. This wow. much room. They were stacked four high. The cots we slept on were about this thick. Unbelievable. So, yeah, Saturday night, I did not get a lot of sleep. So, ho, 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 ho. So there was 45 grown men and their sons in this room, about the size of this room. 45. Wow. 40, you, can, you can imagine the sleep apnea I heard Saturday and, night. And so, and, <laughs> gee, me, people stop breathing in there. Y'all need oxygen tank. Pop. Clear! <laughs> and there was no, there was no outlets in the room. It's a World War II ship. There was no outlets, so all these guys are looking for their plugs for their sleep apnea machines. There's no outlets. Now imagine doing that for months at a time on deployment, oh, fighting I know. war. Yeah, bro. Yeah, can you imagine? Crazy. That, uh, Crazy. Shout out. So those that served, we salute. Thank you. That was yeah. a whole nother. I, I always tell people nowadays, you soft people. Hey, I'm soft. We don't have a generation of young people that would sign up for oh, this. No. No. And, no. and December eighth, nineteen forty one. Recruitment stations were over. That's incredible. Like Bob that, Feller that, went yep, and signed up. Yep. I mean, just just look at the like. E- even when I look at Roar, even on the other side, I look at I watch a documentary about um, the biggest warship ever for the Japanese Navy, and how they basically <laughs> signed up to go to their deaths. Yeah. Like they yeah. knew they would not win, and and just how hard they just fought. All it's the just, kamikaze pilots that flew missions yep. to specifically yep. kill themselves and take yep. out as many U.S. soldiers as they could. And hey. here's me on the ship. Man, I got no service down here. <laughs> hey. What's going on with this boat? I got to go up to the deck to get service. And this, and this PSA was brought to you by the truth. In about five years, they're going to strict all of that from the record. And we never had World War II. It was just a skirmish. <laughs> and it was a, it was a, it was a skirmish. And it was a, a dust up. dust up between two friends. What atomic bomb. Yeah, they'll, 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 they'll ban all this in about three weeks. A busy, busy show. We're going to give our draft grades. Also, we have a draft expert coming on later. He's going to give his grade, not only the Browns, but of the Bengals, the Ravens, and the Steelers. How did our competition do? We're so focused on what the Browns are doing. Oftentimes, it takes us a day or two mm-hmm. to dig in what the other teams in the division uh, were up to. Our expert is going to take us through and give us draft grades on all of the AFC North teams. Guardians in a tailspin. Don't look now. They've dropped six of the last seven series. Mm. And I know that it's May, and you never push the panic button in May, but there are guys that are feeling around for where that button might be. (laughs) Uh, The good news is that the division stinks again, and they're only three and a half games out. So that's a week's worth of work if they can get it together. But right now, I think they have 17 home runs in 26. Seven games, 28 uh, games, 28 games, 28 games, 17 home runs. Have this, you ever seen anything like that? I've never seen a power shortage like this. Yeah, never. I've it's, never it's seen worse it. than last year at this point. I, I might call Albert Bell. Just give him a look. <laughs> Kick the tires. Can he still hit it 380 feet? Because we don't have anybody that can. So we'll talk about the Guardians. Um, we're also going to talk. Kevin Love plays on. Kevin yeah. Love. Now, one off or not, we don't know. We don't know how much he can give the Heat. But the Heat go into Madison Square Garden and steal game one. Kevin Love gives the Heat exactly what the Cavs needed, um, but decided they no longer wanted. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, we're going to take internet comments, what you are saying about the NFL draft. And I know some of you are already ordering your Super Bowl tickets. Pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. Every year after the draft, oh, this is it. We got it. This is it. This is it. Because you hear the 25 seconds that all the analysts say. And, you know, they show you all the highlights. They don't show you the plays 
where they got knocked on the ground if they're a pass rusher or, you know, they don't show you the bad stuff. They show you the good stuff. He runs a 4 6 40, his vertical, and everybody buys the hype. And, yep. and everybody's winning the Super Bowl on May 1st. And, you know, Jay, the crazy thing about it is they don't even say anything remotely non-positive. Ra- the, rarely do Rarely. They. Like, it's it's about, they'll give you a back. If they're not that good, they'll give you a backstory. If you are semi good, they won't give you too much of a backstory. They'll just show you highlights. If you don't have a good backstory and you don't have highlights, they'll just say that this is a great upside pick. So traditionally, everybody that walks across that stage, you never hear Kuiper and McShay or the guys say, I don't know what the hell the, the Titans were doing here. Yeah, it rarely happens. It it, happens. I love it when it does, yeah. but it, it happens so infrequently. And again, when your first pick is the third round, you're not hitting a home run in this draft. You're not. Um, it, you're filling a couple of spots. Do we have enough wide receivers yet? I think so. I'm trying to figure that out. I think we've got think eight so. or nine. We talked all last year. Need to get Deshaun more weapons. Well, they did that. Yeah. I, I think mean, so. we'll get into the minutia of it here in just a second. Um, Bull is not out. He's not feeling well today. What's his bet? Bull is out, and as I get over to the Bet Rivers uh, ad here, Anthony's still out. Earl's upstairs. He's going to get connected. So if you see the monitors change late, that's because I'm doing it manually while reading. Bull won his last bet, and he is literally on fire, 19-8 and eight now in baseball, and he's going back to the baseball pool today with our Bet Rivers pick of the day. Hey, Ohio, Bet Rivers Online Sportsbook is the place to be for every single game. Right now is the perfect time to join Bet Rivers Sportsbook because if you use deposit code SPORTS, you receive a second chance bet up to $500. Get in on all the action with weekly specials on your favorite sports like basketball and hockey to help you win big. Check them out at BetRivers.com or download the Bet Rivers app today for the latest lines, odds, and boosts. Today's bet, he's taking the Blue Jays, giving a run and a half at the Red Sox. Corey Kluber, former friend of the great city of Cleveland on the mound for the Red Sox, but Bull is going with the Blue Jays. And with that, Jay, it is time to turn our attention to the NFL draft. And when we're talking Browns and their draft picks, we are talking about Lincoln Electric as well. Our good friends at Lincoln Electric who are the leading manufacturers in welding and manufacturing jobs in the electricity field. Check them out at Lincoln Electric. Let's get to the draft. Jay. Yeah, uh, we, t- we sort of touched on it, guys. Um, my bi- I'll start with my biggest takeaway, and then I'll ask you guys. Um, I was shocked that not a linebacker was called. Um, you know, when I looked at the linebackers that they had in the draft, I knew this was a, a, a draft where you couldn't find you. There wasn't very many impact linebackers or three down linebackers. I was a little surprised that they didn't take a, a flyer on somebody. Um, I, I thought that they would at least in the fourth or sixth rounds um, or the seventh round take a look at, uh, you know, a linebacker and then they traded the seventh round pick or excuse me traded the um, seventh round pick this year for a six round pick lack what, next year with what, the Ravens. What was uh, Jason? What's the logic behind doing that? No one on the board that they felt was going to make the team. So not going to waste a pick wow. kick can down the road and try again next year because now we had the numbers and this is kind of off the topic, but we're there's a severe numbers game like at, you mentioned that receiver at receiver. When you look at who's on the roster, there are guys that you know that are going to have to have to fight to, to, to make this roster. There's 12, 13 receivers today on that roster. We don't have a receiver room. We have a receiver auditorium. Yes. Like, I, this, is, this is crazy. Yeah, they got a bunch and of And what dudes. are they going to keep? Six? S- maybe, maybe seven. I mean. Maybe. Maybe seven. Well, it depends on uh, wow. the punt return they signed last year. If he's back healthy, Jakeem Grant. Yeah, yeah. Jakeem Grant. Is he? I don't remember if it was a one-year or two-year deal. Now, I think it was he's two. I think he's still on. I think roster. he's still, he's still on the roster. roster. Yeah, okay. he's still, he's still on the roster. Two-year deal. So that's going to be one because you you imagine he's back as the punt returner. Okay. So you, off the top of my head, you just uh, you just got Tillman, right? Well, he, you got. I started the top. Yeah, I started the top. You got Cooper as the one. DPJ maybe as the two. Elijah Moore. Those are your three starting receivers. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, if Grant makes the team, you also brought in Marquise Goodwin. He's good and you just drafted team. Tillman. Yeah. And you've got Bell sitting there and Schwartz. Who well, wants to tell him? <laughs> I think he knows. Does he know? I think he knows. I mean, he's packing a bag and coming to camp. <laughs> I, I think also that means Demetrius Felton. Um, you were a punt returner. 
you were a running back. You did have some risk. I think Demetri Felton is a casualty. I think uh, I'm leaving out some names too. Schwartz is a casualty. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a what was the just uh, Dalen Baldwin on this team. Michael Woods, who's injured. He's on IR, so he won't count towards anything. What'd you think of the Tillman pick? You know, I I, I see what they was going for. Um, I was hot because Jalen Hyde was sitting right there. Yeah, I know. And they jumped up and One grabbed him. One pick ahead of him. One ahead. pick. I would have preferred. I would have preferred the speed guy, um, myself. Um, now here's the problem. I always got people. You know, when you talk to people, and everybody's a draft expert, right? Y'all ain't watched no games all year. They ain't watched nothing. The draft experts that everybody come out, especially for the Browns, and I know what it is. We all are certain, to a certain extent Kool Aid drinkers when when there's guys on the board that we all like or there's guys that you may have wanted. But I've heard some crazy things like, oh, this guy was actually the best receiver. I had him on my board at number two, and I'm like, stop. Please just First stop. of all, do you have a board? No, you do not have a board. <laughs> if Come you on. do have a board, you seek talk, help. Yeah, talk about your board. Seek help if you only have a board. Bo- only board you got is a Scrabble or Monopoly joint. Now, at the end of the day, I like his size. Um, he's not going to be a blazer. He... he he struggles a little bit to get off press man coverage. Doesn't really separate at the top of his routes too much. But he is a long strider. He is 6'3". Um, the Browns don't have... From a, a size standpoint, from a size, I From a size standpoint, he can be a red zone target. I think he, he's I think he's of the mold of a DPJ, but a little bit bigger. I don't have a problem with the pick. Like you said, at the end of the day, it's a third-round pick. Um, you, I can't give A's and all this other stuff because I think this, when you started the third round, you're taking this class past right. fail. It's past fail. I agree. I think I think just because you don't have the capital at the top of the draft, yeah. the, the best you can hope for here is a B yeah, yeah. Uh, as B. a total grade. We'll mm-hmm. get to those later. But how are you going to sco- get an A if you're not picking yeah. until 74 or wherever they went? What, do you like to pick? I mean, the first thing I thought of when I saw him was red zone target. Yeah. So, if, you know, if you can line him up in the red zone and he's a back corner fade route guy, and go catch it at the high point. Yeah, sure. sign me up. Why not? Because we saw DPJ struggle with it. what game was it where he struggled with that? That exact play back corner of the end zone was it and, and he didn't catch it at the high point. It was a fourth down play, I think, yeah. and then batted it down. So if he can do that automatically, he's going to get on the field. And by the way, that that's the same kind of guy that can move the sticks. You run Absolutely. that same route sure. to the first down marker. And so if he's a if he if he is strictly a possession and, uh, you know, I'll go up and get the ball kind of receiver. That's fine. We, there, there's a need for that in, in, in this system. And, and I, don't know, I don't know if Tillman can do this or not, but I know one of the things that the Browns were focusing on was when plays break down, when Deshaun starts to freelance, he needs receivers who can react. And mm-hmm. they felt like the guys they had in the room last year were not great at freelancing. But if you can get in a jump ball scenario where Tillman can just out jump the guy, he's just got bigger size, and Deshaun can make a play – I don't see that as a bad thing. I don't have a problem yeah. with the pick. I, I like the pick. I think that's about as, as good as they were going to do. They certainly have not had a good track record on third-round receivers. No, they have not. So, we'll you go know. back to the well and try again. Yeah, see what happens. Um, I, I, I've got to think that – I mean, I know Bell's just a year in, and it's you really hate to give up on a guy a year in who's a third-round pick. Yeah. But I don't – you almost have to start making decisions here that are right. – you know, you're going to have to let somebody go that you at one point really liked. And that's a good thing. That yeah. really is a good thing. It is a good thing. It's, Be- it's, it's because last year that. they were in a position where they held on to Schwartz because there was no one obviously better. You know, like that's part of it was there was no one clear cut better to hold on to. Well, now if you're building depth on this and you're putting yourself in a position where you know Schwartz probably is not coming back, that's I don't see that as a bad thing. I, th- I think competition and depth, there's nothing wrong with Mike. that. Mike. So I have a, a good friend of mine who I worked with back in Tennessee who is now the sports director at a TV station in Knoxville. So I called him right after the Tillman pick and just want to add a tiny bit of context to what he told me as someone who's known Cedric for the last four years, right. watched him, and, and kind of saw him That's the kind of insight we're looking for. So he was injured this year, and he's had some injury Lost. histories throughout yeah. his entire career at Tennessee, that, that scares me. which is something you do have to take into consideration. But last <laughs> season, 2021, <laughs> He was a second-team All-SEC guy. He was their number one option in the past game right. in Heupel's first season. And you got to remember, Tennessee was pretty terrible under Jeremy Pruitt his first three years at Tennessee. They bring in a new coach, Josh Heupel, completely opens that offense, playing with Hendon Hooker. He was a second-team All-SEC receiver as a junior, over 1,000 yards, 12 touchdowns. And he said the one thing that has been consistent in Tillman's career 
from watching him in practice, games, warm-ups. You know, he's out on the field, field level, because he's up close and personal. He's right. Like, this dude's a basketball player who plays football. And as Jason alluded to with jump balls, he does a really, really good job at high-pointing and winning contested catches. Good. Which, when you look at the rest good. of the Browns' receiving core, they didn't really have a guy like that. No. So no, no. They don't he have may, a guy like that. You know, we look at the ranks. He was as ranked as highly as 59 or 44, on, according to Warren Sharp, and as low and as And we're about guessing six. the slip was because of the, the health it's issues, in, It's right? injuries. It's, yeah. it's can he stay healthy. And speed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not, he's not a burner. And he's not a burner. But yeah. that's okay. I, I, I still think that's okay. I mean – I do too. You know, if Goodwin makes the team, he's a burner. I don't think Schwartz is going to make the team. No. Um, Goodwin can stretch defenses. You know, you just – you need – you need – Slot guys, and I don't, I don't mean to play in the slot. I mean guys that run precise routes and are going to be where they're supposed to be on timing routes. That's Cooper. You need a high point guy. That's probably, we hope, is going to be our new wide receiver. Speed guy can be Goodwin. DPJ can do some things. So it, together, you've got a bunch of guys that can do a whole bunch of things. It makes the offense a lot more wide open. It's just, you know, you're just diversifying the skill sets you got in the room. So... You know, maybe, you know, you could go, you know, with three wide receiver sets. You can go with a big, big, big wide receivers. You can put him in the game, DPJ uh, and, and Mari Cooper. You can go with a bunch formations, three receivers, and you want quick guys that can, you know, really get uh, open in, in man-to-man coverage on, on linebackers or safeties. You can go with Goodwin. You can go with Elijah Moore. You can go with even a guy like David Bell. So there's a lot of different – you just basically at this point, you're just searching for – a few things you like, a couple of characteristics. If you can get somebody that got a characteristic that you lack, you go take it. And you say, okay, well, we'll see if we can develop it, and then we'll figure it out from there. But, you know, it's not like these are first-round picks, and these guys aren't going to if, – if we're counting on these dudes to play significant minutes, we're in trouble. <laughs> because – Yeah, they're mo- mostly situational guys. Yeah. Um, I was a little surprised um, that we took – a defensive tackle and a defensive end after all the free agent signings we made on the defensive front. I know you can never have enough guys and I guess it's Philly. I don't know that they're the, is Philly at the front wave of that. Oh yeah. I mean what they did last year and then what did they do in this draft? Oh, they went God. and made themselves even more dominant that position. Yes. To, G- GMs will often tell you the, the, it, to win in the NFL must have a, a quality quarterback you must have quality guys that get after quarterbacks. Philadelphia really drove that home last year, and it doesn't surprise me that the Browns are going that way because Jim Schwartz was in Philly when they were building that team this right. way. This is a strength in numbers group. Um, they'll be able to rotationally keep these guys fresh, and Jason, that's that's the new it thing in, they've in the never NFL. Been able, they've never had the depth up front. Too. I remember when Larry Ogunjobi was playing like 97% of the snaps. Like, <laughs> it's insane. Right. And Miles was out there far too much. And they've never had enough depth up front to be able to roll guys in in waves and keep guys fresh. And I think that's what they're trying to do here. Yeah. I'm not at all surprised that they drafted one of each. Uh, is- it was by far, uh, the, I mean, especially in the middle. It was clearly one of the biggest weaknesses of the team. They addressed it in free agency. They've also addressed it in the draft. And, again, every year since they've been here, they've taken a defensive tackle. Was it fourth round and higher, I think we said, third or fourth yeah. round and higher. It's the only position that they've done that every it's single year. It's clear that whether it's Dee Podesta or Andrew Barry, somebody in the organization is in love with doing it that way, with g- g- strength up front. And someone in the organization forgot that there's a position of linebacker. Man. Like, it's really – they had five guys end the season last year on injured reserve. And when you look at the depth of the position right now, it looks like it did last year. They, 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 haven't, they haven't added anybody. If – if man, if, if they don't – if they have a couple injuries and guys get injured again, they're going to have to – they're going to have to hear that. Like, they got to well, hold you, that. You, next year could be – next season could be what the defensive line was last year. It could be. Next could year, be. everybody could be saying, well, what do you expect? Well, you, you had no middle of your defense. And plus, all those guys have been injured. Like, they've been in. It's not like JOK has been not been injury prone. It's not how Phillips has been injured his whole career. Anthony Walker has been injured a couple years. In, like, there's not like these guys are like those were aberrations. Like, th- th- those were legit things that you could say about it. Is that it, a dude. product of the NFL going to the undersized linebacker? Like, you don't see guys – 245 anymore at that position. They tend to be around 230. And I don't, 
I haven't followed it closely enough to know if this is, I don't think it's an epidemic across the league, but last year, our linebacking core was wiped out. I think it's a product of, I think it's a product of how your scheme and how terrible you were up front. So like linebackers are not supposed to be dealing with offensive linemen, like every single play. Our defensive line was so bad that now you got undersized guys that are either getting hands put on them or always in the fray or think about it. Even if you're a linebacker, you're taking you. Here's how you know the linebackers was taking a beating. Look at your top two tacklers. Yeah, no, I know your, that. Your, your, your tacklers yeah. are safeties. That means they're people, getting to the third layer of the defense <laughs> way too often. That's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, and plus, let, we'll talk about the Eagles a little bit. These dudes. I mean, they have Brandon Graham. They drafted Jordan Davis last year. who's the biggest dude I've ever seen. Uh, then they still got Fletcher Cox, Josh Sweat. That's their first round, right? That's their first wave. They got Hassan Reddick. Then they draft. That's the outside linebacker. He's he's more of a you know stand up rush guy. Nolan Smith that they just took. He yeah. runs a four three, uh, and he's like two four two fifty. Um, Jalen Carter. After he was supposed, was the best he was supposed the to be the number one pick in the draft. And he yeah. was if supposed to be the number accident, one pick in the draft. Yeah. He's probably the top pick in the draft. And, and, and you, st- I, I don't like these dudes are freaking stacked up front. Like these, that's dudes, as good as it gets. Like you not really run. Like I, I commend them because they could have just stood pat and just said, "We cool. Let's tweak some stuff here, and we'll get back to the draft. We'll get back to." Um, we'll get back to the Super Bowl because you know we 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 got it. We got our quarterback. That's all we need. These dudes just just kept going. Well, they're also drafting for replacements. They know in Fletcher, Cox, they've got some guys that are aging out. Yep. Graham Cox. Yeah, Graham maybe and Cox. Yep. One. yep. So they're they're already thinking ahead. They're drafting their replacements now. And in the meantime, you get all of them. Yeah. So it's going to be really difficult for opposing teams to step back in the pocket and and hope that you're going to get three and a half four seconds to throw the football. It'll never happen with this team. They're going to be in your face from the time they get off the bus. Um, this this kid from Baylor, Siaki Ika. He goes by Apu, by the way. No one calls him Siaki. Okay, Apu. A P U. I learned that. I also Apu. have a friend who works in Waco and covered him. Yeah. Oh, great. So I'll okay. give you the insight on him at the end. But he goes by Apu. So I mean, I only know of this kid what they said about him on draft day. I don't. Re- he didn't. I I don't even know that I watched Baylor play extensive games. This year, if he certainly wasn't a guy that stood out to me when I did watch them, if I even saw him. But the, the guys, we, you know, nobody seemed to think that they were over their skis with this pick. And a lot of meat. He's a big run stuffer. Isn't that what he yes. is at the mm-hmm. end of the day? And that's where we have it's been just hard to move really, him. really woeful. Can't move him. Um, you put him and Thomas in the game, I feel like you gotta, you're not going to be able to just have guys – block him and chip to the next level. That's not going to happen. You want to pe- keep two people on him. Yeah. And then that's where you hope the speed and athleticisms of your F- Phillips uh, and, and JOK can can get back in the backfield and get to, to tackling people instead of being in the third level to, uh, of the secondary. So I, I think he's a, he's a big dude. Um, he's, he's a traditional nose tackle. Um, he, he, ha- he has a little bit better pass rush upside than people give him. Not because he has a bunch of plethora of moves, it's because he can he can collapse the pocket. He just bull rush. Yeah, right? his yeah. bull rush is, is is dominant. So it, it, <laughs> that's a great shot. There. Now look at that leverage. Now think about it. Look how close his knee is to that ground. He's low center of he, gravity. He, right? he is very low. You cannot move a guy. And the great thing about him is he got over thirty quarterback pressures um, in the last two seasons uh, when he was playing for Baylor. He was a transfer from LSU. Um, so he played on that national championship team. So he's he has a good pedigree. He's strong. He's strong as an ox. Got a bull rush. He's very stout on the run. Um, somebody said, "Well, you telling me that he's Danny Shelton?" Then I said, "Well, no, not really necessarily." I said because Danny Shelton was a top twenty pick. You got this dude at pick number ninety eight. Yeah, but I I, I think not, not in terms maybe of quality of play right mm-hmm. now, but yeah. I think. Shelton, to me, was the natural comparison when I saw him mm-hmm. and watched a little bit of his tape. He does resemble Danny Shelton. He does Shelton. resemble a whole lot. Now, if he can get, if he can be as good as Danny Shelton, we, I think that would be a, a huge home run for us at that spot. Yeah, I mean, it's like, like we said, pick 98, you're just looking at, he, if you can get one or two downs from this dude, 
He's gonna play one or two. He's, yeah. he's one or two downs, and then get him out because it's you know it's a no gain or a one yard gain, and bring in some other guys to rush the passer. I would think he'd play a lot on first and second downs, run run situations, and then in passing downs he'll probably be off the field. Um, Jason, what what was your biggest takeaway? If you had to write a headline for this draft, what what would the headline be for this draft? Uh. Browns moved away a little bit from what they've done in the past. I thought so too. <laughs> and I don't know necessarily that's a bad thing. Um, I, I, what I felt they were doing was, I don't know. I don't want to say they've abandoned their old analytics priorities, but to me, it felt like the kind of player that they had been drafting and the things that they were looking for from those guys that was, they didn't follow that script this year. And by the way, I'm glad they didn't because it hasn't worked. Yeah, and I, there's, we talked about it at length. There's a lot of pressure to win, and I think that they went and got guys who they may not be starters, but they're going to be on the field. Tillman's going to be on the field. We just talked about red zone situations, third down situations, points where he can help them. He has a unique skill set that can help them. They got a massive bag of meat in the middle now yeah. that they didn't have before that can help them. He can provide the depth. So they, I think they were very targeted in the positions, and I know they didn't go after a linebacker. I was a little bit surprised. I think it's probably more of the nature of the way that the board fell than trying to dismiss that position, but it has been devalued in the NFL. Like linebacker is the running back of the defense. No question. They're, and you're only playing two but on the field. Still need, you still need them. Yeah, I mean, you used to play four, and now there's Some teams a lot. Did, yeah, yeah, now there's instances where you're only playing two, and most of the time. Most, the Browns clearly like to play yeah, two. Yeah, if, you've got, if, you're in there, if you're in nickel 90-plus percent of the time, and you've got your four up front, you're only leaving one or two spots. If yeah. they can, if the meat up front can clear the way, and it's a big if for guys like JOK, we saw something out of Taki when they moved in the middle. I'm curious to see how they use that information this year. Right. You know, where is Taki going to play just because he seemed to be a different player when he was in the middle, but now that position theoretically isn't I, I open. I think the thing that I'm falling back on is that maybe I'm trying to convince myself that things are going to be okay. But the one thing that I, that I believe uh, – in is Jim Schwartz and his system. Mm -hmm. I think the chances that he gets it right with the personnel they have in the middle of that defense are much higher than Joe Woods getting it right. I we, think, we, we saw Joe couldn't get it right. Yeah, I think guys, what they what they admitted on the sneak tip, on the sneak, I think they admitted we were wrong. Yeah, I think they did too. We we, we did not have the right philosophy. It's a pivot. We it, we they turned over. Uh, they tried to turn over. Multiple position rooms. When you look at the defensive tackle room, they threw so many guys in there because they said these aren't the body types, these aren't the necessarily skill sets that we want. And when you draft that many receivers, what you're telling yourself is, hey guys, look, we missed on those guys. We need to do something to to infuse some other stuff because we've had back to back classes that's been a little bit of subpar. And I think they're admitting to people in their moves and their actions that yes, we were a little, we were wrong on a lot of these guys. We're, we're looking to get some guys in here with a different philosophy. Yeah, I felt the same thing. And look, it, I, I give them credit for this. Sometimes GMs are so stubborn that they refuse to change what they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the desperation that we're seeing here is that Andrew Barry said, okay, I had a book. I went by the book and it didn't work. Yep. And so now we have to open ourselves up to the idea that we may have been wrong and that there may be a better way. And I think this is what we saw here. Now, if it doesn't work, it's going to look like they're grasping at straws and they're probably still all going to be done. But at least, you know, the definition of insanity, we all know what it is. Mm -hmm. They didn't go down that road one more time. Mike. We're going to get to the day three picks here in a sec. But we have a new sponsor I need to tell you guys about. Oh, Lorraine exciting. Community College is officially on the UCSS nice. train. Best decision they've ever made, and this is the best decision that you can make. If you don't have a college degree and want one, check out Lorraine Community College. Your class is your future. Register now for summer and fall classes. You can learn more at LorraineCCC.edu to learn more. My well, alma mater. Yes. I went there. Like did you really? I did. I did two years there. Got a pre-journalism degree. Everything transferred to Kent. If you want to be like me and make up things about Donovan Mitchell, go to LCC. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I no, we will that. get to that in a bit. I promise. <laughs> I love that. Stand down on that Jason. point. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, real quick, though. For everyone out watching, never we've got made a ton up of people. in the world that you've written, anyhow. A ton of people tuning in, watching right now. We appreciate you guys. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. 
Absolutely. We're going to skip Dewan Jones and the day three stuff. We're going yeah, we'll to end our draft coverage him. with Dewan Jones. So yeah. when you see us skip that, we have not forgotten Dewan Jones. We will get to him yeah. as it relates to that's an interesting fifth pick. year option. We will get to that, I yeah. promise. Let's start uh, with Isaiah McGuire, who was yeah. the first day three pick. We'll run through the rest of them, and then we will end with Dewan Jones. What, what did you guys make of that? I'd like, I, I'll, I'll be honest, never saw him play. Didn't know, knew nothing about him at all. Um, I've read extensively about him since. I've, I've heard all the comments that the guys made on the telecast. Uh, this is your area of expertise, so I'll let you start. Uh, so shout out to the uh, Locked On Browns uh, podcast, your team every single day. So we featured Isaiah McGuire as part of the, uh, some of the defensive ends that might be available with the Browns. Um, picks. You had him on your list then. So, oh yeah, when you do a show five times a, a week <laughs> for every day, you got a lot of people on the list. It's a <laughs> lot of hours to fill. <laughs> so, <laughs> So Isaiah McGuire, he, he's a prototypical. First of all, you love the single digit. Yes, he had a single digit. So then when you look at it, you're like, okay, I got to watch you now. He had the number nine. So he, he's a prototypical size, six foot four, six five, range, 270, 272, 274. Um, the thing about him is I think he's going to be one of those guys that is, is really good at stopping the run. You know, he, he's kind of in a way like Jadavian Clowney. He's not as athletic anywhere near as athletic. He's as long, that. right? Yeah, more of a four, se- more four seven guy. But he has a really good upper body uh, punch. Like when he punches, he can separate. I think he's going to be a good in the run. Uh, his bull rush is his best move. Um, his bull rush and his motor is, is actually his best two attributes. So anytime that you, you don't have any other mix up moves and you don't have the level of bend, and your knees to run the hoop and, and, and you know, really get um, low to the ground, low centrifugal force to get to the quarterback, you're going to slip to the fourth round. But there's one thing that he really does very well, and that's motor. He's very strong. He can disengage. Um, he, he's good, good, good mobility in the box from left to right. He's not going to be a huge pass rusher. Uh, I think he only had five or six sacks his, his, his second year um, uh, wild, wild starter. But you know, when you can get a guy like this who can help and contribute, I think you build the depth. Now you say, okay, I got, uh, you know, I got Isaiah Thomas, right? I got Alex Wright. I got uh, Isaiah McGuire. You have Oboe out there. So you got now those young guys that are kind of jockeying for that position because you want to spell Miles Garrett too. Miles Garrett, you, you want to get him off the field. So now you say, okay, well, let me see what Alex Wright can do. I'm going to see if Isaiah Thomas is going to be that type of position. And I'm, and this guy is in the mix. He's a guy that I think he contribute today um, if he's just, if you're just using him as a pass rusher. So I love the pick. It's another depth pick. Um, and now you kind of see, once again, you don't have Chase Winoviches out there <laughs> just moving <laughs> around, just doing nothing. You, you're starting to get a little more depth, and so I like to. Pick. But, but but in all fairness, Chase Winovich coming out of Michigan was, was a, a piece. Yes, he was. Like, he we was thought nice. this kid was going to be yep. a player. Yep. And then I don't and know he what just happened. Did not pan out. Yep. I don't know. He just was like he got a little. He weird. was all hair, no game. <laughs> yeah, he just started growing <laughs> his hair. Looked like Tarzan, played like James. My goodness. <laughs> uh, do you like it, Jay? I mean, I think if nothing else, what they've done is taken their area of weakness last year, and I'll give them credit for this. Was qu- clearly, it was the defensive line. Yeah, that's going to be the most competitive position group on this team this year. And that's what I like about it. And I, I even say the same with receivers. What I said earlier: there's nothing wrong with competition. Mm-hmm. So bring all these guys yeah. in, and the best guys get the spots. Yeah. And I don't know that we necessarily had a lot of that last year, especially across the defensive line. I don't know that there was really a lot of camp battles and position spots and spots up for grabs. And you're going to have that this year. And, you know, a guy like Isaiah Thomas, I don't know. Is he a sure thing to make this team? No. You you know what I hope they do, Jason? Teams rarely do this. But here's what I hope they do. I hope they put these guys out on the field and forget about where they drafted them. (laughs) Just take the guys that can ball and tell them that going into camp. I don't care if you were a first-round draft pick. I don't care if you're Miles Garrett. He's clearly going to make this team. Yeah. But – what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate it, and at the end of the day, there's going to be eight of you that climb to the top of the mountain. I think and that, the, and I don't care where you came from and where you were drafted. The eight best are I, sticking with this I think team. The, I think they're finally set up to kind of do that. Before you saw a lot, you what you would see with traditionally with the Browns because they were drafting people to help them out, and they they had people that they drafted that they thought was going to play very pivotal roles with the organization right away. It, right away, so. You, you already got a guy slotted. Then what happens if he goes out and, and pulls a hamstring, tweaks this, tweaks this? He misses the whole training camp. 
Now he's behind the eight ball. He's out of shape. He really doesn't know the playbook. And now he, you're going to have to use the regular season to ramp him up. Now I can say, look, hey, Isaiah Thomas, Alex Wright. I think I like Alex Wright, but I might not. You might not be better than McGuire. Right. We're going to figure out today. And this, so now you got guys who know they can't miss practice. You got guys who know they have to show up to OTAs because now there's competition where, look, Jordan Elliott at one point in time was given the D starting defensive tackle role. They got Hill. They got Hurst. They got Ika. Uh, they, they got they, they even got Tomlinson. That's four right there. You still got Perry on Winfrey. You still got Tommy Togi well, for now. Uh, for now. Yeah, I think Winfrey's dead I'm, man walking. So there's we're we gonna get to this. Uh, him and Schwartz can go. Winfrey, yeah. Winfrey, <laughs> apartment shopping they're, together. They're they're USFL teams right now. L listen, hey Boogie, you might have a new teammate. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, I, I, I also think that Schwartz is the right guy to judge this talent. He's not coming in with any baggage and preconceived ideas. They're all new to him. Right, right. And I hope, I hope that the Browns give him the keys to this entire thing and say, here's your pile of clay, build your statue, and the clay you don't use – we're getting rid of. Oh, I think they will. I think I have no doubt that they're going to tell him. He's the head have, coach of the defense, yeah, right? You have full control, full autonomy. Who you want is who we keep. Who you don't want is who goes. And I think for the most part, they do have the may the best man win mentality outside. Listen, if you're a first round pick, obviously you've got a little bit longer Facts. of a leash. The fact that there is no incoming yeah. first round pick, you know, you're probably not going to have that. I do think it's going to be very much a competition and very much. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it, especially at that defensive end D tackle spot. Of it's all sort of wide open. You would imagine Thomas is probably going to start, right? They gave him the big money deal. But so. outside of that, who's starting next to him? Can we say with 100% clarity who's starting no, next to him? we can't. I, I kind of like that. And, and the other thing, too, is, and, and we saw this with Philly, like, you can have ones and one A's. Yes. Because this is this is more like Philly has one C's. Than it's, like football. it's amazing how, <laughs> right. you know, back in the day in baseball, your starting pitcher was your pitcher. Right, right. And he went all nine innings, and then somebody looked around and said, you know, there's got to be a better wheel. Why are we working these guys, letting them go through the lineup four times? They're tired. The game is in the balance in the eighth and ninth innings. What if we brought in a fresh arm from the bullpen and it changed baseball forever? Mm -hmm. I I'm surprised that it's taken this long to get to the NFL, but this is a max effort position. Yeah. And these guys only have so many fires in their body mm -hmm. every Sunday. How many times can you stoke that fire? And we see it and with hockey, and I know nothing about hockey. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's like you're sending in a new wave, yes. a new line. Hockey, there, it's like every two minutes they're on because they well, go so hard. Because it's 100% max effort. Yeah. I remember when I was young and I first started playing hockey, I hated the fact that I ever had to leave the ice. Yeah. I don't want to come off the ice. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, the more I played, I'm like, Get me off the ice. <laughs> My tongue is hanging on ice. It's dead. Yeah. And so you really get and and football is the perfect sport to do this with because yes, there is in, in hockey. There's no time between plays. You're constantly moving. But in football, because that is such a max effort position on every single play, yeah. you wear out. And the fact that now they're going to have a one and a one A unit and they're going to mix and match. It's you're going to see kind of like in the NBA playoffs where they talk about combinations. The Browns are going to have combinations of guys. And who did that better than anybody I've ever seen than Jim Schwartz yeah. last year? Coaches. He always... perfected this thing. Now can they play? Yeah, can right. they play? It sounds great. Coaches. But you know what? Can any of them play? Instead of getting four guys at maybe 65% in the fourth quarter. Yeah. They're going to have eight guys that are at 80% and you can fill and mix and match with combinations. And I think it's brilliant and I think it's going to work. Coaches, coaches always say, don't save yourself. You say, what does that mean? There's a lot of dudes out there that will take plays off because they are tired because they want to stay on the field. We don't need that. If you're yeah. tired, we'll get, get you off out. the field. Yep. Then you come back and you give me everything you got on the next rep. Right. I think that's, the, the, you know, in la last year we saw guys with the hands on the hips and, and Atlanta running the ball 14 straight times and, and, and they tired, they suck it air. But guess what? You didn't have nobody to put in. Right. Who are you going to back them up with? You, that, that's all you had. The head scratcher for me, guys, was Dorian Thompson Robinson. Now, as a player, I did see him a lot this year, and I loved him. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love his grit. His He's got that. He's not going to lose. He's going to do whatever it takes to win. Um, but I was, I was shocked that they drafted a quarterback 
was Dobbs just a one-year signing? They usually are. I'm not right? at all surprised. I think well, I said on he, the show that I thought that they might draft Well, then he's the heir apparent. Like, he is. He's the backup. Like, he's yeah. the backup. If you can get yeah. a guy who, yeah. I, I mean, Chad Henney was a lot higher of a pick. I think he went, I think he was like a second rounder, he's actually. He's a second round yeah. pick. Yeah. Okay. But it's the same type of concept. If you can, de- if you can draft your backup, develop him, he knows the system, you can plug him in if you need him, you're not spending a ton of money there. We've said it before. If Deshaun goes down, the season goes down with it. You don't want to invest a ton of money in the backup spot. But if you can have consistency in that spot, and he's a dual threat in the same mode as Deshaun, so he fits that role perfectly, if you can get four, five, six years out of him where he knows the system inside and out, for the fifth round, I have no issue with this I, th- I thought that was a, a value pick. Yeah. I, I, thought, I mean, I thought he would go higher than where he went. I, I think now you're finally seeing it. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching Ohio State play the spring game. And Kyle McCord comes out, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, who is this guy? This is not what it is. And people say, oh, no, G. Bush, listen, give him, give him, give him a chance. He's going to, like, you guys are just so negative. A bit. I said, no, listen, what y'all don't understand, this is a philosophy. When you look at Ohio State, you got Dwayne Haskins. You you look at, uh, after that, they have Justin Fields. Fields. Then you get, uh, you get another quarterback, C.J. Stroud. All of those guys have a certain level of arm talent, certain level of throwing the ball. So, so if you know what you excel at, you know what type of mold you have at quarterback, then you got to set up your succession plan so that when one guy graduate, we got another dude that's already running the same kind of stuff, could do some of the same things. Because guess what, Jay? What if you got linemen that are sophomores, juniors, returning guys? Now, they're used to playing with a Fields. They're used to playing with a C.J. Stroud. And guess what? When your new quarterback comes in, because they have similar traits, everybody's on the same page. We're right. running the same off. Ain't no, well, we got to go to a more of a balanced attack. And I think this is exactly what they did with the Browns. You look at this guy, by the way, I just call him DTR. I, you know, I, I can't be memorizing all your last names. <laughs> uh, DTR, my man, they brought him in. And the great thing about it is now you look at it. You got Josh Dobbs, you got him, and you got uh, you, you you got Deshaun Watson. Of course, these guys don't have. It's a nice quarterback room. They don't have the same skill sets as Deshaun Watson at that highest level. But guess what? If you are now looking at this 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 mix in, in four guys, it ain't a Jacoby Brissett Deshaun Watson discrepancy. I can run the same offense. These guys are mobile. They can move their legs. They can move the pocket. They can all improvise. And so now, if one of them goes down, guess what? The game don't stop. We still run in the same offense. And what happened, I think they made a conscious effort of saying, we loved what Jacoby Brissett was able to give to us. But the offense from those 11 games to the six games was night and day. And we saw how we took a step back. We want to have continuity. So, all our guys are similar height, similar weight, similar skill set. And so if one, something happens, we run our program regardless. This is what we run. Yeah, I like him as a player a lot. Um, I I don't know that you if you wait much longer, you're not going to get he, what I like about him is he's he's comes from a, a, a program that he's played in big. It's games a big time before. program. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather go that route than, you know, a yeah. me state right. or yeah. North Dakota state where you're like, yeah, but what was the competition they were playing against five years? At least this guy, he was playing a lot and he was playing against really good teams. The USC UCLA game. I don't know if you guys watched it. This I, watched year. That, yep. I mean that that alone crazy. Game. I just remember thinking at the time, whoever gets this kid's going to get a good quarterback. Mm-hmm. I, I never in a million years thought it would be us. So I'm glad it is uh, the last two picks. Cameron Mitchell is interesting. He's a corner from Northwestern. Um, Teammate of Greg Newsom. Played with Newsom at Northwestern. And because Newsom was a home run, yeah, I still think Newsom was one of the better draft picks of this regime. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Emerson as well. So I'm not even going to question this pick. Um, I think they've proven that they can they can draft defensive backs. They know what they're looking for. At a for. high percent. They know what they're looking for. So in they, they got, I think they got him a, another one here. And then lastly, um, they got the big offensive lineman from Ohio State. Yeah. And when I say big, I'm pretty no, sure. No, before we get to Dewan, they also took Luke Weifler, the no, that, center that, from Ohio State. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 We'll get to Dewan Jones in a sec. I have a read before that. Jason and G, real quick thoughts on the Mitchell and Weifler picks, and then we'll do a read. Then we'll get to Dewan Jones. All right. I, I, you know, Mitchell. Depth, go ahead. Depth. Um, slot. He could play slot. He could play special teams. Um, I think it was a, a reverse Jedi move, mind move, right? Hey, we could graph any corner in the world, right? 
Well, who you want to bring in? Well, I, you know, Greg Newsom has been mad a little bit. Let's bring his boy in, right? <laughs> yeah. So now he comes in and now he has this guy there and now he's going to tell him, hey, man, if you want to make this team, bro, you got to get on these special teams. You got to learn to be versatile. You play inside and outside and, and, and quite as kept. That's what he should be telling himself. So I think this is it works two birds with stone, one stone. It's always good to get a familiar face in the room. Weipler, I thought would have went higher. He was early. He came out early. I think if he would have stayed another year, he could have actually been rated higher and been a third round, maybe even a third, fourth round pick. Um, I like what he is, but he, he's more of a project. But I do think that that move signifies that Nick Harris might be not on this roster as well. Yeah, um, you sign well, Ethan's potions. This guy only plays center, right? And Nick Harris can play a little bit of guard. He does some things too. So I think this move. That's but he's a, a th he's a seventh round pick, he's a, though. I mean, but, but yeah, that's Nick, a, Nick you're was, not afraid to cut a seventh round. No, pick. no but yeah. I, I, but I think this is. I mean, let's face it. We thought Harris was going to be in the starter, right? I, I don't think, think. I don't think. I think this is a camp battle. I, I think this is. That. I you think do. this is a camp battle. I think Nick's on this team. I think Weipler's probably on the practice squad. Yeah. He's one of those guys. He's a depth. Uh, they did expand practice. You know, the, you can hold more guys on the practice squad now. So we'll wait and see. Can, can either of you remember? I can't. A time when the Browns drafted two Buckeyes in one draft? No, no, we don't draft Buckeyes. I don't think we've ever done that. Yeah, it's rare. And what's funny is that Pittsburgh has made a history of drafting Buckeyes. Yep. And they've almost all been home run hit uh, yep. picks. Yep. Guys that have helped them win Super Bowls. While we have notoriously stayed away from Buckeyes, I don't understand it. I it, don't it either. Make, and I, I mean, the Browns. I was with Phil Savage when Phil was here, and Phil was in Columbus watching film with uh, Trestle was the coach at the time. So it's not like like they are there and they do scout them and they do watch film. But they don't. They don't know. That, but they don't take Pittsburgh. Them. Uh, Pittsburgh loves Big Ten guys. You know. Yeah. They, I I knew they were going to draft Porter when the second round started. I just knew they were going to do it. It made perfect sense. I was surprised that they didn't trade the pick. I was surprised. Really? Just because I think there was a lot of interest in it. Yeah. Uh, and for them to hold on to it, I don't know. I was a little surprised. I think that the temptation to draft uh, a Joey Porter again yeah. <laughs> was, was too, much too much to overcome. I think they said a really high. to think about it, too. Yeah, I think they set a really high price. Yeah. And if someone was going to come up and meet it. And I no love Porter at Penn State. I was stunned when I heard that he had just one interception during his career there. He plays with a chip. Yeah. Plays a lot like his dad did. Yeah. He's all over the field. I think it's a, I think it's his a bad dad was fit a for that. Beast. His dad was, I hated oh. whatever the Browns had to go against the Steelers. You knew you had to find was 55. Yep. You knew you had to find him because he was going to be around the ball every time. Okay. We're going to circle back to Dewan Jones in a second, but you want to, yes, do a read I got to read real quick. Then we're going to talk about Dewan Jones and where he fits in on this offensive line, especially with some other moves on the O line. The Browns have made, but it's a great time to remind the good people out in the world that the USFL is back. Professional football is going on as we speak. You don't have to wait for the preseason of the NFL. The USFL is in Canton. $10 tickets. It is phenomenal family fun for everyone. Check them out at USFL.com. How'd Pittsburgh overall. do? How'd our boy Boogie do? Our guy Boogie got his first win and had a fumble recovery this week. Oh, nice. So there you the go. Ballers officially on the board. Boogie. Uh, on the highlight reel for the Pittsburgh Maulers. There we you go. You don't just call them the Maulers. They don't have a city. They're just the Maulers. Yeah, let's keep them the Maulers. The Canton Maulers. Boogie. Let's claim them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, with that, let's talk about DeWan Jones, yeah. Jed Wills, Jack Conklin, and the Browns tackle situation. They As picked you up alluded Wills. to, this guy's a giant. He, I think he'll be the biggest player in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken. Will there be anyone bigger than, than DeWan Jones, guys? I was trying to get the measurables on him. Uh, was he 6'8", uh, 374. Yeah. Three seventy five. I don't know that there's a bigger player I, in the NFL. I, I'm not going to give you my – we're not going to talk grades specifically, but this elevated my thought process of what the Browns was doing. Because for once, they actually did what most conventional GMs think about. They're like, man, this guy, let's look at his, let's look at his ability. He's a guy who's who's a basketball player, former basketball player, right. and he's not a like soft basketball player, or he's just out there to take space. No, the guy has feet work. The guy has a skill set, and on top of it, they would have never taken a guy like this in the past. They would have never never thought about drafting a guy like this. Um, to me, he reminds me a lot of Orlando Brown Jr. 
And Orlando Brown Jr., a lot of people don't look at really, the mismatch. Look there. at just get up out of it. Just, just. <laughs> it looks like Andy Reid in the punt pass. I mean, it's Toledo. I mean, that was Toledo. It was Toledo, but, but <laughs> I mean, that might have been Mr. Irrelevant that he was blocking yeah, there. I don't know. You, yeah, he, uh, he, he, look, he, he dwarfs all people. He, do, he's like he, he blots out the sky. Like he, <laughs> remember, it was three hundred. <laughs> Cersei's was it's like Dewan Jones eclipse. <laughs> My arrows will blot out the sky. He's this, just massive. He's he didn't, a beast. He didn't allow a single sack, did he? Last he wouldn't year. even allow pressures. It's incredible. Uh, to me, I look at it like this. If you can get somebody with, with that 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 ball of clay that he is, and you can say, okay, let me go ahead and work with Bill Callahan for a year. That's what excites yep. me. Let me go ahead and get you yeah, my That's over here. what excites me. We, put, we, we might even put a red shirt on him. When he get into the minutiae, start working that technique, start understanding. And I'm going to tell you what. This dude got the ability to play right tackle and left tackle, in my opinion. And he may take three or four leaps because of his just natural ability. You can't teach long arms like that. He'll lock out on you from here. And because who's teaching him? Yeah. Like, he's got the guru. He's got yeah. the best ever to do it. And he makes Orlando Pace look small. <laughs> I, I never thought I, that was a thing. I never but thought that does. was a thing. But he does. I mean, it's. I, I think of all of the picks... Uh, it's interesting because the Browns had to make a decision by today, and they've made the decision. They're going to pick up the option on Jed Wills. So he's going to be here making $14 million this year and next year. But because you have versatility with Jones, you could put him at right tackle yep. for a couple of years. And if Jill's, uh, if, Jill's, if, if Jed <laughs> Wills it doesn't develop into the number 10 overall pick that we thought he would, by then, you've got two years under your belt with Jones at right tackle. Maybe he becomes your long-term answer at left tackle. Is that what the Browns are thinking here, Jace? I mean, I saw this as the Jack Conklin replacement. I think I think Jed Wills is going to be in Cleveland for a really long time. You do? Yeah, I do. I And, you know, people – and I even said it last year, sort of Duke and knee-jerk. I, I fell into G's camp of, well, you know, as Wills is out of here next year. And people who know offensive line play a lot more than me say his good plays are, are good – his bad plays are awful, and they're more recognizable. And I'm talking about Jed. Obviously, sure. we, we've all seen his bad. Well, Joe Thomas said the same thing. Yeah. Well, there's one guy who knows a lot more <laughs> yeah. about offensive line And play. he also said, where are you going to go and find a replacement? That's, and you know, and that's, that's why Jack Conklin's back. We thought Jack was going to retire. I really did. And then he signed up to a four-year extension. Yeah, that was – But I'm still, I'm still trying to sort of wrap my head around. But well, he won't see the end of that. He deal. won't. And yeah. that's the supply and demand of the position. And that's why if they're re-signing Conklin – Jed Wills ain't going anywhere just because of the of how much it costs to to get these guys yeah. and how difficult it is. It but, was a savvy move though because uh, one of the things that we had to keep in mind is that if he did get to uh, a year, if the Browns hadn't picked it up, and let's say he takes that leap that they're waiting for him yeah. to take, if he takes that leap, then you got to franchise him, and I think the franchise ballpark number is around twenty Mike, million. Mike said they had twenty three million. Twenty three million. Twenty million. Numbers, exactly. So you say you know yeah. You're betting that he's going to continue to develop, and right. why not with your offensive line coach right. and Bill Callahan? So if he continues to develop, maybe he is here a long time. I don't know why they waited till deadline day. To, I don't know, but it was never a question. They were always going well, to it pick was, it up. It was reported weeks ago that they were going it to do It was this. always going to happen. Yeah. Why they waited till Man, I don't know. I, you, you had your bet. Like, like look, I t look I'm, I'm all for the money. I'm all for spending all of it. Like, uh, you, it's a smart move. Like, okay, I'm going to give you 14. It's just 14, you know, for a top 10 pick or whatever. Now, here's the here's the great part about why I love bringing Jones in. Because now, I'm going to be – it's something to be said for turning around and seeing a man of that size in your room. Yeah. Right, up, right behind you, like, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm trying to get it. Like, all that – like, see, Jed Wills, I wouldn't even say – I wouldn't even say it's his bad plays. That his bad plays was a lack of consistency and a lack of motor and a lack of, of hustle and wanting to go get it. You don't stop. Like, that's the cardinal sin. Like, like here's, I'm going to say this. He wasn't doing that when Nick Saban was doing it. Nick Saban don't play that. All right. that stopping in the middle of the play and I, you just let a guy to lose because you didn't know what to do. No, he would have done that once or twice and, under, he, under no, that regime uh -uh. and he would have been on the he, bench. He'd been, on his, he'd been sitting beside me. Now, here's the great thing about it. Now, you got a dude that's coming in like that and you know he played for a top-notch organization, a top-notch uh, uh, school and you got Bill Callahan as a guy that's teaching him. He better come out here and do his thing. He better come out and do his thing because yeah. guess what? 
He's sitting right behind him. Like, hey, I, hey, you, Conklin, go ahead and get hurt. You know you be hurt half the time. Conklin, go ahead. Jed Wills, that you better get your ankles wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> double get, wrapped. Double wrapped them ankles, bro. Because now we got some, we got some competition in here. I like to pick. Um, I, I mentioned that there's no linebacker that was drafted or uh, <laughs> still no backer. I, I'm going to go back to that. Um, so I'm looking at the list of linebackers that the Browns have coming back next year, and it's thin, guys. They need one more. They need one more. I, what I think they lack that they don't have. I saw Devin White wants to be traded. Yeah, Devin White, the Buccaneers linebacker. Yeah. Yeah, that was a while ago. He's going to make $20 million. There's the, the Browns essentially have no chance of fitting that's into their salary cap. Well, he's going to, but not, not this coming year, right? Well, it's his fifth-year option. He's the fifth overall pick, so is he making so let me, let good me, money? Do you, do you know? I, do you, do we you talked know about it when it happened. You did. I'll find his exact salary it, for the upcoming year. I was, I was hoping that the Browns would do something and go out and get a player of his ilk. Is Reggie Ragland still of this squad? $12 million this year, by the way. Yeah. Okay. That's well. It's better than twenty million. Uh, I know. Oh, wait. Real quick. Gee. Real quick. Before we move on. Um, no. Ragland's not on the roster, right? Ragland's on the roster. But is, in terms of the Jed Wills discussion, Jason alluded to him being here long term at left tackle. Do you two, G and J, do you guys think Jed Wills is the long term tackle, or is Dewan Jones a guy who you think eventually moves into that spot if he develops as a? Uh, I he can. I'm not. Listen. Just based on, just based on watching it. Right, I'm not a big Jed Wills like fan. Like I'm not a fan of his his the way Jed Wills has to play. He don't know it yet. Jed Wills feel like he can play at a certain level and speed because he's just that talented and he get that off. That's not true. He's not like the, the, like the Orlando Paces of the world, the Jonathan Ogdens of the world. Uh, 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 you know those guys, the Anthony Munoz. Those dudes are physical. Joe Thomas. Those dudes are physically gifted. They have very low, they have long arms, very low body They're weight. Also very tactical. Great. They, they, had, they were tacticians. They were tacticians. He's not a tactician. Well, you also mentioned some Hall of Famers there. He, I did. Now, I he's did. Not, yeah, we're not going to confuse him we're, as, not, as a Hall of Famer. He's not a, he's not a ta- if he would just play hard every snap, he could be a fine pro. Joe, yeah. Joe said fine. something that was interesting. Joe said, when when he realizes that he's lost his man or that he's that he's not sure what to do, he stops. He just stands around. Yeah, and and jo- I think yeah. Joe said, just go hit somebody. Right. You can't, you right. Can't do that. Don't ever be caught on film going like this. Right. Where'd he go? <laughs> yes. I mean, too many times. Do something. Yeah. And and I I kind of think that to your point, Jay, these guys don't fall out of trees. Thank God they'd cause earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't fall out of trees. They're not easy to find. It's probably the second or third most, most important position in the sport. Yeah. You're Deshaun Watson's bodyguard, and you have got to make sure that you're not letting guys get free releases on you, and it happened too many times against with, with Jed. I, I do think that I always go back to Callahan. I just think that the talent is there. He relied on that pure size Mm -hmm. and knowing that eight out of every 10 plays that he played at Alabama, he was going to win based on that. This isn't Alabama anymore. If it is, you're playing Georgia every week Mm -hmm. and the worst defensive end in the NFL is up to up to beating you. If you're, if you take a nap on a play. So I think that if Callahan can light a fire under him and get him going, Maybe he can live up to that number 10 overall pick. But right now, long term, like when you think past two years, if he continues to look just like he has his previous three, I don't I don't think he's the long term answer. But again, who is who, uh, who is and maybe maybe you'll know that you've got two years now to reevaluate him. You've evaluated him based on three and you've decided he's earned two more. These next two are prove it years. Because if he doesn't show improvement and he just continues to be a guy there, I don't know that the Browns are comfortable saying we're okay with him being our third most important player in our franchise. I don't know that they're okay with that. I just, he just has to finish play. He just, you know, he has, hopefully that turns on a lot of people, a lot of people, maybe his ceiling is average. 
Maybe a maybe it is above average. And Who be, knows? Because where he was drafted in the 10th slot, we have certain we expectations. Have certain, but may, maybe we have to come to the realization that he's not that guy. Mm -hmm. He's never going to be that guy. And if he's not, maybe you move him to right tackle. And, you know, if, if DeWan develops and shows the ability to play left tackle, maybe you just put Wells uh, uh, put Wills at right tackle and put Jones over at left tackle. You got call some it a day. You got but some I, I do think now. you've got two nice bookends yeah. that – Every team wants to have, and, and I can't wait to see what Jones develops into under Bill Callahan's tutelage. All right, uh, we have a read before we do this? We do. It is officially noon, and you know what that means. It is the lunch hour of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, and as always, the lunch hour of UCSS is sponsored by Colleg Racing, the official NASCAR team of Northeast Ohio. And with that, NFL Draft expert Kyle Krabs from Lockdown NFL Draft is joining us. What's up, Kyle? Busy weekend? Get us anything uh, on? Yeah, we... Uh... We had a couple picks that uh, we had to pay attention to and a uh, couple hours, you know, just watching 259 selections from all 32 teams. But it was, it's a blast and we love it every year. So I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Kyle, how deep did you go on, on any of your mocks? Uh, the, the furthest I went, I did a two, three round mocks. Okay. So, you know, you, you'll hop on one of these draft simulators and you can like pick a team and, and do seven round mocks. So you do seven round scenarios for teams trying to get to know uh, just how deep the needs go and kind of get an idea for all the different combinations if you prioritize position or X or Y early on. But as far as actually projecting the first or every pick, it was three rounds and, and I didn't have the stomach to do the seven rounders like some of the guys. Did. Yeah, I don't know. how they, I, I, I think it's an exercise in insanity. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, based on the three rounds that you went, um, do you feel, how, how do you feel things played out in reality versus how you predicted they would play out? Yeah, I, I, I think you saw uh, the vast majority of talent that went uh, was the talent that I would have expected to go. I think on, on Joe Marino and I for Locked On NFL Scouting, uh, we did a, a final predictive board, and 84 of our 100 actually went in the top 100. So I wow. would say that that's relatively, I don't want to say chalk, but uh, a lot of what you expected as far as the talent itself. Now, Cleveland was one of the beneficiaries uh, of a couple of players that that did end up sliding a little bit with Siaki Aika, who fell all the way to 98. Uh, Dewan Jones, obviously, at 111, who you guys were talking about coming in with the decision with, with him long term and how he develops and uh, Luke Whipler from Ohio State was another one that we thought had a pretty good chance to be a day two selection as an early entry uh, as well. So um, not too many crazy surprises. I, I think a lot of people were surprised to see Darnell Washington, the Georgia tight end, fall as far as he did. Sounds like the medicals uh, were pretty ugly in that regard. But uh, that's the part that's really hard on our end of things is not getting a chance to, to have access to all the information the teams do. So sure. you uh, have to just trust whatever – caused that slide there was something legitimate because all 32 teams continued to pass did you have a, a what's the thing that shocked you the most about the draft man i was really surprised how many you know and, and it's cleveland's included in this but it, it's not a big picture uh early round discussion but just how many quarterbacks were drafted i think a lot of these teams saw uh brock purdy Mr. Irrelevant and said, hey, why don't we roll the dice and draft some guy that <laughs> has fringe or, or, or lower level tiers? But I actually think that the quarterback that uh, Cleveland got DTR was my favorite day three quarterback just for the athleticism that he has. And I got a chance to meet him over the summer last year and, and really enjoyed his leadership style and, and talking about the game with him. So I think he's a really nice developmental type for Cleveland, especially to play behind Deshaun Watson with some of the parallels in their athleticism and, and ability to make things happen on the move. So uh, just the, the raw number of quarterbacks that I never would have guessed were fourth, fifth, sixth round picks. And these teams were, were kind of jumping at the opportunity to roll the dice and uh, take a developmental quarterback early while there was still some really good scheme specific type of talent or developmental type talent at other positions that maybe had a more statistically uh, likely probability of you hitting on it and getting a nice player that can contribute for your team. You know, Kyle, you know, Jay talked about it earlier and, and, and I was pointed out last year, you know, the Browns, they do have some guys, some veterans, Sione Taki Taki. Uh, you, you, you got guys like JLK who's back, Phillips is back, um, you know, and, and guys in the middle like Anthony Walker, but no, no, no linebacker. Um, was that a function of um, the Browns may not have liked any of the linebackers starting in the third round, moving back to the seventh or whatever the case may be? Or do you feel like 
it was a it was a shallow uh, linebacker draft in general for a lot of people. Yeah, so I'm just kind of pulling up my my sheet here to look. I, I think that the tone was set really early with Jack Campbell, which last time I was on with you guys, I, I gave you the idea to maybe go up and trade for Jack Campbell. And sorry for that advice because he went at 18. Right, and, right. Uh, that crazy. was never going right, to happen. <laughs> But then after that, you had to wait till 67, where, where Drew Sanders was the next one off the board. So mm-hmm. I think that gap, that separation between a guy that you felt like could you know, play and, and deconstruct blocks, but also defend the run and rush the passer a little bit in and, and Jack Campbell versus all these other players that, that were more incomplete or skill-specific type players, uh, I think it, it kind of bit Cleveland a little bit that the run for linebackers happened so late uh, where these guys kind of came off hot and heavy. You had five linebackers go between 67 and 91. And, and if Cleveland, obviously, they, they draft Cedric Tillman there in that stretch of picks, and I think that's a good selection. I think that they, who's probably a guy who I would have expected would have been gone a little bit earlier towards the back end of the second round. But once the run kind of happened, man, I, don't force it. There, there's other personnel opportunities for you that, that are going to be coming after June 1st when some of these guys get cut or – you, know, you get through training camp and guys are or it's evident that they're going to be moved. So I, I appreciate them not forcing linebacker when that third round really seemed like it was the stretch of players that you felt guys, if they were going to contribute pretty early on, they all went in that stretch and picks. And, and I actually like the player that, that Cleveland got in Cedric Tillman a bit more than the vast majority of those guys. That's what I wanted to ask you about Kyle was Tillman. Uh, obviously when you're starting out in the third round, it's going to limit what you can do in a draft, but I just, my immediate thought was a big target in the red zone, a guy who can go high point the ball on fade routes and something that they really didn't have last year. Just your thoughts on Tillman and how he fits with the Browns and if he can get on the field right away. I think he can. I, I think he's uh, more dynamic than David Bell. And I like David Bell coming out of Purdue quite a bit who they, they got last year, but uh, Tillman, I thought was the better Tennessee wide receiver. I think he's more well-rounded. Uh, I think he's more physical than Jalen Hyatt. I think Jalen Hyatt's a little bit more of a one-dimensional, vertical, down-the-field, nine-ball type of player versus Tillman. I think you know, working comeback routes that work back down towards the sideline, the ball skills along the perimeter, the ability to high point the football and play with physicality. Um, I, he just had a quiet year this past year, and I know he dealt with an injury throughout the course of the season, so you miss some playing time there and out of sight, out of mind versus some of these other receivers and uh, a couple of the guys that ended up going in front of him and Nathaniel Dell and Rasheed Rice and Jaden Reed, Jonathan Mingo, those guys were in you know, a round two selections. They were all players who had a chance to go down to the senior bowl and, and you get an extra data point for, for them to look at there versus uh, Tillman being somebody who was kind of off the beaten path this year when Tennessee's offense exploded. So uh, I think this is a potential to be a really nice kind of value pick for Cleveland. And I think Cleveland has a, a number of guys that can be candidates in that regard. But Tillman it was a player I like quite a bit. All right, let's do grades. Um, and we'll start with the Browns, and then we'll go through the other AFC North teams. Uh, what do you give the Browns, Kyle, considering that they didn't, you know, they didn't have a lot of draft capital up, up top, and uh, they traded away that last pick, their seventh round pick. But the dam- What damage did they do in three through six? Yeah, so I, you know, the Dewan Jones, Isaac McGuire, Dorian Thompson, Robinson, Cameron Mitchell, Luke Whipler stretch is, is a really good day three haul. Uh, so, so I'd give their day three picks an A as far as the big picture while acknowledging you don't have a one, you don't have a two. Um, it, it's a class for me that's probably a solid B plus, but it, it's hard to, to buy all the way in just because of the lack of those slam dunk prospects that don't have the questions. And I think Whipler is probably a little bit of functional strength questions. Dewan Jones seemed like he rubbed the teams the wrong way, whether or not that actually ends up being a problem or not, that's going to be up to him and how Cleveland is able to get them into uh, their program. What do you mean by that? Elaborate on that rub teams the wrong way. So I know Dewan went down to the senior bowl and did one day of practice and, and then packed it in for the rest of the week. And, you know, it just felt like that was something that teams kind of, raised an eyebrow at that he passed on so much of the he was passive throughout a lot of the process and they want to see you take those opportunities to compete to test to to check boxes for them and he took the opportunity to go down there he had a really good first day and then he spent the rest of the week in street clothes and didn't partake and he didn't give you the full participation in the pre-draft process from an athletic profile testing perspective so just i i i 
it felt like, and I'm, I'm trying to extrapolate and read between the lines, it felt like teams uh, were a little hesitant based on uh, his strategy in the pre-draft process, whether that's justified or not. Again, that's up to DeWan. Did but he explain uh, that, I, I thought from a, explain- a talent perspective, he was a top 50 talent. Did he explain why he was passive and why he pulled out of some of those events that typically guys have to go through? I'm sure he was asked about it in the interviews. Uh, I don't I don't believe there was any public uh, discussion that was held in that regard, and, and that might have been part of it too, whatever, you know, when he was asked directly by the teams in the interviews, uh, if they did ask him and whatever he offered to them for context uh, may have been, contributed to that too. But I never in a million years would have guessed he would have fell out of the first two days of the draft. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll take that as a nice value pick there. Hopefully he doesn't turn into a personality, you know, a difficult personality to coach. I, I didn't, if that was his reputation at Ohio state, I, I never heard anything about that No. at Ohio <laughs> state. Um, so, I mean, obviously, like you said, teams a lot of times they're, they're, to all that information. Those guys are going off advice from for, for agents, agents. Right. And yep. And it's really not not more than that. It's yeah. they're listening to the people telling them what to do. Yeah, and it's obviously sometimes that's not wise advice. Well, right. You know, when you pull yourself out of that process, uh, it does send a certain message. And whatever the reason may be, whatever reasons he gave, I'm sure in his mind they were valid. But that clearly, it, that presented issues. I hadn't heard that, Kyle, but that makes perfect sense now as to why he slipped as far as he did. Yeah, and, and he was a player who, you know, probably the mock drafts projected a little bit higher but you also think about uh orlando brown jr who went through the pre-draft process and tested the combine and put up like an all-time stinker combine performance and he went from the first round to the third round so that's probably part of the discussion as a player who's of similar stature like look let's not give him any reason to to start poking holes but when the alternative is to don't do it then teams kind of get leery of okay what what is he, he and his team potentially trying to avoid us yeah. having access or having information on that would, that would alarm us to, to who he is. So it's, it's, it, you guys make a great point. You know, every camp has their own unique strategies on handle, how to handle this pre-draft process with how valid or invalid they feel the information and the data points are or are not. But uh, for Dewan, it, it's not a talent issue. I will say that. So we'll, we'll just have to see how well he hits the ground running with his time in Cleveland. Um, we talked about, um, you know, the, we haven't really dis- discussed the other teams in the AFC North. And, but, yeah, man, the, the Ravens and the Steelers, I, I like the pick of Darnell Washington. Um, maybe you, you alluded to something uh, in terms of his medical that could have dropped him a little bit further. Maybe you could elaborate on that. And then also uh, Zay Flowers um, to the Baltimore Ravens. Um, they got Odell Beckham Jr., they girl good Zay Flowers, uh, Lamar Jackson is back in the mix. What did you think about those two moves for the Steelers as well as the uh, Ravens? Yeah, well, from Washington's perspective, this was the most physically unique of the tight ends in the class, and we had a crazy amount of tight ends go. I mean, more tight ends in this class than, than any year in recent memory for me. Uh, I think Washington was a, a really good value pick for Pittsburgh. I would have guessed he'd have been a top 50 pick as a floor. They got him at 93. Uh, it sounded like there was something with either a knee or a foot with him that had some some teams concerned about medicals. I know there had been some commentary about weight fluctuation during his time at Georgia as well. And he's a big guy, 6'7", 260, 270 pounds. So uh, for, for Washington, if, if the lower body medicals on a big bodied frame like that is probably there's some longevity questions. But if Pittsburgh gets one contract out of them, they get five, six years. I mean, it's, it's going to be a good good return on investment with the 93rd overall pick in the draft for what he's physically capable of bringing to the table. I thought there was that was their best value pick, but I really, really like that Pittsburgh class as a whole. As far as Baltimore, you know, not quite having as much draft capital to work with, but uh, Zay Flowers and that selection, they're, they're not really – leaning any more into well Lamar has to play in a run heavy offense and you know we're, we're gonna do all the heavy tight end stuff I mean they're, they're really leaning into and obviously they paid him 52 million dollars a season so they'd be smart to do it and try and unlock every bit of potential that he has as a passer they're really going the opposite direction of what that offense has been the last couple of years and whether or not it all clicks together and works is going to be the, the big science experiment and chemistry experiment for the Ravens as far as what that offense ends up looking like so what are your grades? Let's start with the Ravens, then we'll go Steelers and Bengals to finish it up. 
What, what did the what, what, what? I think the Ravens they, they were handcuffed a little bit by lack of draft capital too. They right. obviously gave the two for Roquan Smith, gave him a big contract. Uh, I like their value on day three as well. Tavius Robinson, big body pass rusher. I really think they need more pass rush help there. Uh, Caillou Blue Kelly in the fifth round at 157 is a player that if you told me he would have been their pick at 86, uh, I wouldn't have batted an eye. I, I think that was a really good value for them, and especially with Marcus Peters not re-signed. I mean, he has a potential to step in there and take some pretty meaningful snaps. So Zay Flowers, Caillou Blue Kelly, uh, I'd give that draft class a B. I'm a little leery about Trenton Simpson as a stack linebacker. It feels like he might be the heir to uh, Patrick Queen, who they, they are uh, kind of facing a fifth-year option decision with. And he didn't do too well in stack linebacker situations. He was more of a hybrid player when he was at his most successful. So I'll need to see what the plan is for that. But I give the Ravens a B. Uh, Pittsburgh, I'd, I'd give an A. Uh, Broderick Jones, Joey Porter, Junior Cano, Benton, Darnell Washington, those first four picks, uh, there is a consistent theme with those guys that they are prototypical size. They are big-time physical players. Uh, they, they are very much leaning into that MO of Steelers football. And, and I know that's – an eye-rolling cliche to bring up. But with those four dudes that they brought in, I think they're great scheme fits. They got good value with Porter. Uh, he could have been their pick at 14. And Darnell Washington, I think, was a steal on day two as well. Yeah, I know you say it's eye-rolling, but trust me, uh, being in Cleveland, it's a thing. Uh, and, yeah. you know, you want your team to have a point on the horizon. Like, who are you? What are you about? And while we've been asking that question relentlessly over the last 30 years with what this organization is and where they're going, other than a million different directions, with the Steelers, and I'm glad you brought that up, they know who they want. They, they always want and they always get dogs. They get guys that want to rip your head off. And one of the things that we talked about last year was this Browns team had no dogs. They had no fight in them at all. And then you play a Steelers team that you think you have more talent than, and you lose to them because they have more want to. Mm -hmm. And I think you nailed it. You know, they went out to Pittsburgh, went out and did it again. They find a bunch of guys that once their name is called and you're like, of course the Steelers took him. That's yeah. exactly where that player belonged. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you, Broderick Jones, they did a great job to go up in front of the Jets and get him too. It sounded like the Jets had him dialed in as, as their target after the trade down with the pick swap. So the fact that they got aggressive, they gave up 120 to go up and get him and lock him in, and they still got those other three dudes. And, and Corey Trice in the seventh round is a guy who fell because of medicals as well as far as concerns about, I think, another lower body injury there. But he ended up having a really good pre-draft process and is another prototypical length guy. So – Porter and Trice is big long corners. Kind of that's that's been the mo in Pittsburgh too. Is these physical long corners, and uh, I think obviously as with the legacy pick of Porter and, and is the family lineage there, uh, y y they have to feel really good about what they accomplished. And it, now it's just a matter of how quickly those guys can round into form and, and be the best versions of themselves. Well, let's wrap it up with the Bengals grade. They're the team that everybody in this division is chasing. Um, did the gap between the Bengals and everybody else widen or? Did the other teams uh, sort of play a little catch up here? So I, I like their first two picks in Miles Murphy and DJ Turner, but I will say I, I feel like a lot of Cincinnati's draft mirrored what it was last year, in which it felt like they were drafting in advance of needs. And, you know, when they're getting ready to pay Joe Burrow what they're going to end up paying Joe Burrow, and they get ready to pay Jamar Chase what they're getting ready to pay Jamar Chase. I get it. You're going to have to make some financial decisions and having those guys in the pipeline and in the system and, and having a year of experience or two years of experience before they're stepping into critical roles. It's, it's a good way to create this sustainability as you're giving out these big contracts and you have to let guys go. Maybe it's a guy like Sam Hubbard ends up being the guy they move on. Maybe it's Trey Hendrickson they end up moving on from. But Miles Murphy, th these feel like pipeline picks more than they feel like immediate return on investment picks. Now, they'll play rotationally. Uh, but but DJ Turner, you know, as long as Chidobe Awuzie is healthy, I don't think he's in the starting lineup. Miles Murphy, I don't think he's in the starting lineup. So they got deeper. I don't know that they really uh, accomplished improving their starting lineup so much as they tried to give themselves flexibility. And I like that strategy for them, but it, it, it's just a matter of I don't know how many more snaps they're going to get out of those guys versus some of these other draft classes where guys are going to step into definitive roles that the teams had the need to fill. Very good. So overall, the division did very well. Um, I, we, you'd say the Steelers of the four won the draft. The Browns probably 
came in second? I would say so. Yeah, I, I think the Browns, would, especially when you, you grade on the curve of where they started making their picks versus right. Cincinnati. I, I like the, the talent that, that Cincinnati got uh, more than, than the talent on the whole of what Baltimore got. And, and Miles Murphy and DJ Turner are really big needle movers that, that you know I would give them the nod over, or at least Miles Murphy the nod over any individual player that the Browns got, but they picked them at 28. Cleveland did pick till later, and I think sure. that their, their day three value really – help bridge the gap. So I'd put the Browns probably second on this divisional list behind the Steelers. Last thing before we let you go, uh, who won the draft? Which team in your mind had the best draft and proved their team the most? Mm. Uh, I really like, I really liked a couple of teams, what Detroit did. I understand yeah. there was some discussion about their early selections and drafting a linebacker and a running back and a tight end at 34. And then they draft a safety at 45, but I think they were head and shoulders some of the best players at their respective positions. Now, Gibbs was obviously behind Bijan Robinson, who was off the board when they picked. But uh, that, as an upgrade over DeAndre Swift, I think is a huge potential upgrade because DeAndre Swift just really hasn't lived up to that potential. So DeAndre, or, or the, the Detroit Lions had four picks in the top 50. So when you get that kind of volume, it's going to be really easy to get a class that everybody likes. Um, another draft class that I, I really, really like was Philadelphia's as well with Jalen Carter, Nolan yeah. Smith, and then Sidney Brown in the third round was a player who I thought was a really good steal for them. And then Keely Ringo from Georgia, uh, the corner in the, the first couple of picks of the fourth round, they traded up to get him. So I, I'd give Howie Roseman a, a tip of the hat here too for what he was able to do. Yeah, he did, did a great job. And, and you're right on Detroit. Suddenly Detroit feels like not only the class of the NFC North, but with with all of the talent being in the AFC and the NFC right now, it feels like Philly and everybody else. Detroit might be a team that makes a deep playoff run. They, you know, they seem to be pointing in the right direction. I think they got the coach right, and um, everything seems to be falling into place. Kyle, excellent stuff. Really, really good stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Kyle Krabs. Well, it's my my pleasure, guys. Uh, good to catch up with you. Hope to talk to you all again soon. All right. Absolutely. Very, very good. Uh, Thanks again, deep Kyle. Deep knowledge. We should have asked him who was number one in his big boards uh, going into 2024. We missed an opportunity. <laughs> These poor guys are he's, hit with oh, that he's still here. between we'll, the we'll eyes. We'll get him real quick. Caleb Williams. It's, it's Marvin Harrison, right? Uh, Marvin Harrison's the top non-quarterback. Caleb Williams from USC is my guy. is the, right. the number one player. But non-quarterback, Marvin Harrison, ain't even close. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would agree with that. All right, yeah, nice. Kyle, thanks, thanks, man. We appreciate it. Really, really thanks. good stuff. Yeah. Really good stuff. It is 1220. Jason, you have to hold it for a little longer. Jason has to pee. I'm just going to throw it out there. Okay, He's going to leave during the next. We're, he has to stay for this topic. We're going to let him go after the next topic. But we can't do this next topic put without Jason. Blast. Be, listen, Bull went up and took a crap in the middle of the show. He came back one day and told us about it. So all yeah, things yeah. on board here. Steam. But, uh, Bull, but Bull's fine with that. He likes that. Yeah, yeah Bull. Is yeah, he's open on everything. Jason, we've laughed about it before. We'll laugh again. Once you go for the next topic, but real quick, Call of Racing, the official NASCAR sponsor of Northeast Ohio, also <laughs> sponsors the lunch hour of UCSS. We can't let Jason go for this segment because this segment is literally built around something he said last week. I had a workout class at 9 a.m. this morning. I drank like a gallon of water by. Yeah, well, that'll do it. So that, that'll definitely do it. Dying over so here. So last Thursday, the morning after the Cavs were eliminated from the playoffs, Jason wrote an article on the Athletic. And then came on the show and we discussed Donovan Mitchell's future in Cleveland. We're going to play the clip in one sec and then react to it. But this went viral over the weekend. It was aggregated by a couple of the big NBA social media oh, accounts. Man. Uh, we're going to play the clip. <clears throat> we'll show you the tweet. And then JG, Jason, we'll all react. Here's a clip from last Thursday. The talk all year long has been Donovan's going to New York the first chance he gets. Like every time I talk to people around the league, it's, well, Donovan's going to New York. Donovan had told you that. At his introductory press conference, he said, I thought I was going home. I thought I was going to New York. He went there last night. We didn't ask him about New York. He brought it up. He's the one who mentioned again and said, I'm, I'm over it. Well, are you really? Because you're the one who's still talking about it. I didn't bring it up to you. And then once he brought it up, that's when I said, okay, what did you mean by that? Like, then we had a little bit more right, of a New right, York right, conversation yeah. after the game last night, but only because he went there first. So you have two years of control left on Donovan Mitchell and then a player option year. More than likely, he's not picking up the player option. These guys want to get back into free agency and yeah. get their next contract as sure. soon as possible. You have two years left. Do you really think, after all the assets that the Cavs gave up to acquire him, that they're going to run the risk of leave, letting him leave and getting nothing in return for him? Right. No, you're going to have to trade him with a year left on his contract unless you get a big extension out of him, unless you get a commitment out of him. 
I don't think that's happening. From everyone I've talked to, he wants to go to New York. Now, does New York want him? I don't know. But that's where he wants to go. That's where he wants to play. So then that got aggregated. This was the first one, NBA Central, which has 3 million followers on Twitter. It got over 10 million impressions, which doesn't help us get paid, but, you know, good exposure for us. The quote that they took from that, from everyone I've talked to, he wants to go to New York by our guy Jason Lloyd. Uh, It's been 72 hours since then, Jason. (laughs) There's no change in your stance. I have one question for Jason to start off with. Have you received any pushback from the Cavs or from Donovan Mitchell on your statement? No. Okay. None. The defense rests. (laughs) I mean, honest to God, because that that was the one thing I wanted you to talk about. Yeah. Because if it wasn't, they've seen it. They've called you. Oh, they've seen it. They've seen it. They just pull up with you. If if it wasn't true, somebody would have reached out to you and said, Jay, you're on the wrong path. I like you. I respect you. That's that's not correct. I've talked to the Cavs in December and January about this. Right. And told them I'm not writing it now, but like it's out there. So the, yeah, it's not anything. And what was their response then? Are you are you free to say that? Uh, or was that off I, the I don't want to get into it. That's it was fine. it was pretty much off the record. That's fine. But they they are aware that I was talking about this in December and January, and I told them I wasn't going to write it then. So so the level so this and, and so we've been. You know, Jason, you know, he's been, we, he, you know, we talk and he's like, yeah, guys, we ain't going to go out. I'm not going to, we got to jump. Why don't we try to jump off the porch with it? But this is some stuff. So there'll be stuff that you'll hear and you just go about doing your job. You, you don't, there's certain topics that he'll know or, or Jay will know or Bull will know or somebody, somebody that told me something that you don't even say half the time. Right. You don't even say it. You just go on doing More stories. More than half the time. Jason, what do you write? 15% of the stuff you know, 20%? I, I've probably, yeah, probably about 20, 25%. Right. Yeah. So if it get to that point, and it took a, it took him all year just to say that, and he told us that back back in November. Like, that is not earth, by the way, this is not earth moving uh, noise. Like, if you can't look at the, the climate of what the, the NBA is with, with Kyrie and Kevin Durant and James Harden and all these other moving parts, if you guys don't know that by now, y'all are crazy. Like this is the way these guys move. It's a it's a business. It is a this is their legacy. And basketball players more than any anybody really take the path that they want to go and they they control over their career more you know over the top than any other player. So I don't know why you would not assume that. We've been saying that for a long time. Like look, were bro, you surprised by the reaction from the basketball world? Because I, you know, on the surface, it's New York, right? And and they're still playing, and they're not, they're never good with not getting up. They thought they were getting LeBron when yes. he went to Miami, KD, and and then as soon as it doesn't work out, screw that player, man. We don't want that dude anyhow. But they want Donovan Mitchell. You would think. Why wouldn't they? Right, right. I mean, with the pieces that they have. And you add Donovan Mitchell to that. Now yeah. you talk about not just a team that can make it to the Eastern Conference semifinals, and who knows how that series is going to work out. It's yeah. not, it hasn't started off well for them. But he might be the difference maker in New York that we were hoped Donovan Mitchell sure. would be the difference maker here in Cleveland. And I don't know. I'm, and we're two years out. I don't know how they make the numbers work and if it's free agency, tra- whatever. You know, that's not really my concern. Really, the only reason I was bringing it up was because, and, and I, I get it, I hear it all the time, like, well, Cleveland media is trying to drive another player out. Or why are you guys talking about this already? Guys, we're talking about this because the NBA is talking about this. I'm telling you what leagues and teams are saying. And the Cavs know about this. Like, they knew this when they traded were for Were you hearing him. it from players or executives or both? Uh, teams, executives, teams. executives, agents. and So they know it's circulating. Yeah, of course they know it's, it's out there. It's a small but tight circle. Yes, and but teams have to plan one year, two year, three years out, four years out. They're always looking. You heard Kobe talking about it at his end game, end of season presser about going into the tax. And, and it's, he said exactly what I was telling you guys three months ago. It's, it's not about going into the tax. It's about starting the repeat offender clock. And you have to be strategic about when you do that because those taxes are so much more punitive. So know that he made it sound like they're not going to be a tax paying team this year because they have to worry about three, four, five, six years out. Teams plan for this stuff all the time. That's why we're talking about it, because that's what they're talking about. If you're the Cavs, aren't you immediately talking to his agent about a long-term extension? Sure, yeah. I mean, okay, do you and I would imagine that, that conversation those... Is ha- ha- no, is I, I, don't, I don't know, but I would imagine that it's an ongoing... 
it's not like you pick up the phone. And by the way, his agent was Colin Sexton's agent, which is just another little oh, funny twist in all of this. That's interesting. But it's not like you just pick up the phone at the end and go, okay, like, what do you want to do? Like, this is an ongoing. No, but if you're the Cavs and you're hearing this, and, and, and they're hearing it too. Oh, yeah. You, you probably weren't the first person but to he, tell them about but it. He would never, but he, he would never sign that because of this, right? He wants the flexibility, right? Because when Kobe Altman says, we're not making any, any sweeping changes, and if you're Donovan Mitchell and you want sweeping changes, then you're going to say, well, I'm not signing nothing. I'm going to see what you do to put a team around me, and then we'll look at it to see how that team well, gels. Was some there, there, there was something going on on – the Cavs bench during one of the timeouts. Oh yeah, when and he was getting hostile or animated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, what was that about? I, I didn't ask. I don't know. It, it's yeah. nothing. Yeah. It's it's in game frustration. Do you sense that there's any frustration? No, and that's why I want to go back to what you said. I don't know that Donovan wants sweeping changes. Like you know, I don't I don't want to put oh, words yeah, in his yeah, mouth. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. know that. I mean, listen. That's why I said before he was sent here. He didn't come here on his own. He was sent here in a but trade. Man, at his news conference. It, he said all the right he things. He sold it like this was his end-all, be-all destination. But and he said he was excited that they didn't have to give up any of the big pieces to get him. They still had Jared Allen. They still had Darius Garland. They still had Evan Mobley. He was afraid they'd have to break off one or two of those in order to get right. him. He was thrilled that they were all here. He has been a model teammate. He's been an exemplary leader, <laughs> takes accountability even at times more than he probably should shoulder, although I think he gets a lot of the blame for how they played in that Knicks and series. And he took it. And he took it. Like, he's been great. He's been great since day one, and I don't want to misconstrue anything on that. He's been exactly what they want from him. I'm just telling you, he thought he was going home. It would be like, you know, if you got drafted to Albuquerque, G, and then you had the opportunity to come to Cleveland, come home, you think you're coming home, and then they ship you to Buffalo. And you're like, oh, man, well, I thought I was going, all right, well, I'm going to do the best I can here, and I'm going to make the best of the situation, but – I kind of wanted to go home. It's it, the same. I don't. I don't fault him for that at all. Right. I don't fault the Cavs for making the deal. Like they had an opportunity to draft a, or trade for a superstar with three years of control left, and they were just felt like their contention window was opening. So they make the big swing, and you and you look at it, you go, "We've got two years to convince him to stay before we have to make a decision." And that's still in play. They still have another year. Guys can change your mind. Kevin Love was adamant to me when LeBron's gone, I'm out. And then he ended up staying and signing another long-term deal. So guys are human. They change their minds on these things. I'm just telling you where we stand right now. I, I don't think you're, I don't think he's changing his mind. Um, let's be real. You can go back and look through the annals of time when guys are super, he, he'll probably still either be first or second team, all NBA first or second team, all NBA dudes do want control. They want to control where they go. Look at the people who got traded. Kyrie Irving got traded to Boston. He said, I love it. Love it here. It's my team. I got Tatum, Brown, all these young dudes. It's me. We about to... Less than two years later, he's like, nah, I need the control. I want to go where I want to go. Start my own thing. He went to Brooklyn. I'll even go to the highest level. Now, I know Toronto ain't a mid-market team, but it ain't crazy, crazy NBA team. But when they got Kawhi Leonard, they went to the promised land. They went to the championship and beat the Warriors. And Kawhi Leonard was like, all right, appreciate you. I'm going to take I'm, I, going, I'm home. going home. What makes you think I'd be trying to say it. I, I listen. You may say we guys up here, the media, you know, I, I jokingly say I'm the Duke and knee jerk, but all I'm doing is just giving you the mirror. Now, when I show up, you can decide if you want to believe it or not, but the proof's already been there. See here we forget so quickly what happens. We just we throw it away. And if someone just says to you, I like you because I understand Cleveland, man, you got to stop falling for that. And every time somebody reports something, every time, every time somebody give you something, you don't have to take it personally as if you want to bury your head in the sand and can't be a fan anymore. Trust me. People don't walk around and just make up stories to be truthful. If you I got in this game and I'm I always call people. I say, listen, I'm the least of the most locked in dudes in the game. I don't even got sources. And then one day I got some sources and then it messed me up because I'm like, this is really what be happening. This is really like if you really knew 80% of the stuff that's available to talk about or that you knew that don't get reported, it would screw up your fandom. So just just relax. We're no Jason's not printing, you know, phony dollars here. Uh, it is what it is. If you just take a look at the uh, a look at the tea leaves, and at the end of the day, 
that Donovan Mitchell ain't no different than the rest of the players that make these same moves. He's not signing no extension. Why would he sign an extension today? And that is something that's looming over the organization. It is what it is. Yeah, it doesn't benefit him financially to do a deal now. Not right now. The no. pay scale changes as often as it does. Yeah, um, in Jason's defense, not that he needs any defending. Um, Real quick, Jay. Yeah. If anyone wants to come at Jason, I'll fight him. <laughs> like, I think we all will. I will do trial by combat, but see, Game here's, of Thrones style here's for Jason. The thing, though, That's and, my dude. I'm just throwing out there. Jason, I got you back. It's not just Cleveland fans. Yeah. Okay, it's but, not. I want to start by saying that. Yeah. Um, that's the universe that we're immersed in, so sometimes it appears that way. Yes. But when we give our opinions on players and – it's not the most glowing opinion of that player. We're not saying that because we want that to be true or we want to make you upset. We're saying that because that's what we think. Right. Now, in the case of Jason and his reporting, there's no opinion in what he reported. <laughs> what Jason reported was what he is hearing. That's what reporters do. Yeah. It's not like you heard it from one person and went with it. You're seasoned. You know, I need, I need multiple sourcing on this. Mm-hmm. I need uh, different organizations, different voices. When you start getting to a threshold where it's no longer a whisper, it's not necessarily a shout, but they're talking in openly, front of everybody. Openly. That's when Jason feels comfortable enough to report it. The anger at Jason for what he said is so misplaced. <laughs> it, 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 he doesn't want this to happen. He doesn't necessarily have a dog in the fight it's his job to write about what he's hearing and to talk about what he's hearing and we're sorry if Browns fans don't like it there's no agenda I'll guarantee you before the show starts Jason doesn't sit down and say how can I rile up the the (laughs) Cleveland fan base today and trust me I'll be asking them inflammatory questions to get them riled up I try to get Jason to say stuff and I'll be trying about yo you're not gonna get he's a pro he's a pro's pro are you trying to let me so with that with that all being said real quick just to put a wrap on this and before we talk Kevin Love for two minutes knowing what you know what Jason's reported what we all think what we've all heard do you think Donovan Mitchell ends up playing his final two years on his current contract in Cleveland They'd have to win like a championship. They'd have to like go to the finals or something. Uh, it, I would say no, and here's why. The talk that he wants to go to New York is out there. It would be irresponsible for the Cavs to let him play here for the next two years, knowing that he is going to opt out when he can, mm-hmm. and then they're left looking around going, what do we have now? Right. Oh, what, no. What, what do we have now? Oh, and, and, so, those, and, them, and no draft capital? No, so what has to happen... Ooh is you got to get all the major players in a room and you have to talk this out and you have to do it sooner than later. You have to ask Mitchell, not his agent. I want to talk to Donovan Mitchell. Donovan, we're trying to do the responsible thing for the organization. I know you're worried about you. Is there a scenario where you opt into that third year and what are the ch- where are we on negotiating or talking about an extension? And if you're hitting a brick wall on those talks, you have to do what's responsible right. for the organization. And sadly, that would be moving him after one more season because you cannot have this move not give you a championship or even a playoff series victory at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you've got nothing to show for it. This is where it we can't are. happen yeah. that way. Yeah. It can't play out that way. We were supposed to win a series and at least this would have pacified you. At least this no, would have put a malay. No, over over some general fans, it would have been like we're right on target, right? Yeah. For the Next other year, we make it to the final. Right. 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 The right. Finals. right. right. But now we. I'm sitting here laughing and like. Come on, man. You talk about this is a year, and then now we have no capital, and we're going to have to move them some, for something you know we're not about to and sell high. if the Heat end up bouncing the Knicks, and the Knicks end up being who we thought they were, yeah. it's even worse for Cleveland because you lost to a team that you should have beat, and you lost to them, and here come the Miami Heat, who I think have finally figured out the paradigm or, or the Rubik's Cube that is – how you approach the regular season, and how you approach the playoffs. And why shouldn't they be the team to figure it out? They've got Pat Riley there helping, you know, Spolstra figure all of this out. Spolstra's made playoff runs when when LeBron and D-Wade were there. He's grizzled. He understands the game. 
this is one of the more stark examples of a team coasting in the regular season. Hell, they almost didn't get in. Mm -hmm. They coasted too much. Dang. And But once they're in, they know exactly where the button is, and they push it, and all forces are activated. And now it looks like they're on their way. I know it's early in that series, but winning game one at Madison Square Garden, uh, you win a second one there, and you're winning the series. You're going to have a five seed or an eight seed in the conference finals in the East, and a and six or West. a seven, in a the six West. or a seven in the so West. Right now, the lower seeds are fi they're 500. Yeah, they won. You know, they they won two series in the West and two series in the East, and it's a product of teams kind of figuring out what we need to do to win in the playoffs no, no, yeah. and what we need to do to win in the regular. I, season. Thinking of that real quick, G. And I know we're on the series, and we got to get the Guardians in a sec, so we have to end with PCC and some internet comments. But Kevin Love played a big role yesterday as the Heat won. The only time we'll talk about Kevin Love unless he scores 20-plus points in a series, I promise you. But how much did it hurt to watch him do the little things that Cleveland didn't have against the Knicks now in round two playing the same team? Is there anything more than a hell of a lot? <laughs> it hurt as badly as it could hurt. Because what he gave Miami yesterday in game one, is exactly what the Cavs needed and didn't get in the Knicks series. He came off the bench. He only played like 15 or 16 minutes. He scored nine points. He hit a couple of threes. He had, there's a funny tweet out that said with his first pick in the 2024 NFL draft, the Miami Dolphins take quarterback Kevin Love because we saw him do it here for years. Yep. That outlet pass on the break, yep. he, he throws it as well as anybody in the NBA. He gave you, he gave you what Jared Allen gave you in 42 minutes. <laughs> He gave us 15 or 16. That's Nine crazy. points, five rebounds, four assists. That's, Un exactly. that's, that's my, but you know what? That's all you need from him. Yeah. As, you don't need yeah. 30 minutes from him. Right. As a fan, as a, I try not and to. And good for it. Kevin, by the way. Yeah. I try good not to Kevin. do this. I try, but I, I just, I, I can't even, like, it, it makes me physically angry and sick when I talk about the Cavs. I just can't, like, I, I try to avoid it because the the level of hubris that they spoke with after after it was all done and I'm like and then I'm watching Kevin Love contribute and now you telling me about how 50 wins is a as a landmark man listen I'm gonna keep it real with you it's a lot of dudes out here that's a losing mentality that's a that's a losing mentality don't tell me about no 50 wins I saw LeBron get 66 and we was pissed as hell they lost to the Magic in the finals. Like, it's levels to this, man. Listen, I'm going to keep it real. He talked like a guy that know his job is secure. And I'm going to just be honest with you. Dan Gilbert may not be running that level of the organization. And he feel he real comfortable right now. But to sit up here and tell me about 51 wins and how that has a lot of cachet with me, like, come on, man. I just, it, it, it irks me because the same thing that we got mad, we not dumb. We said the same thing about the Browns, remember? I said, no, you got six games. That you you chose the gentleman's panel. You got six games, and we're gonna watch you and see what you do. And guess what the cat? Just what the Browns did. Kevin Stefanski went to a seminar and said, "You got to talk more." <laughs> they, they, Andrew Barry said, "This and this analytic stuff. <laughs> we might want to just start drafting off of who's good and who's not. And we need to turn this roster over. We need. That's what happens when the pressure is on you. But he feel like he has no pressure on him." Zero. When I watched the Miami Heat come out here with without Tyler Hero, with Jimmy Butler, and it and, and it says this about the league, that ge it's a generational thing to me. Look at the teams that's winning, LeBron. You got your boy Chris Paul, those guys, those guys that you got Kevin Love. That's Jimmy Butler. These well, even the Warriors. The now. Warriors. Look, all of that good talk. Them dudes is a different type of breed. They like, oh. Y'all win all the regular season games if you want to. So what? Yeah. So what? I'll, I'll catch you. And I, Steph Curry, I'll put you out of the playoffs on your own court. Well, that's what I wrote after Kobe spoke was th this one time I'll let you hang a banner for 50 wins because uh, where this organization was two years ago, and it is significant, it's a step, but that can never happen again because you can't tell us all year the regular season doesn't matter. And they tell you that by sitting all their stars. Yep. Yeah. All year long, every team sits their stars. You can't come back then at the end and celebrate the regular Look season. Look what we did in the regular season. When they just when you spent the last six months downgrading the regular season, yeah. it, you can't have it both ways. And we had we talked at the onset of the season after the Mitchell trade, we had all kind of gone through and said, "What makes this year a success?" And I was greedy. I said, "I want a trip to the Eastern Conference Finals. 
that that that's what it's going to take for me. Yeah. Because when you're telling me that we've got these four superstars now, what other team has four superstars? I and think. Go ahead. I, so for me, I said, and there were a lot of people said, "Oh, I don't know. That's a big lofty goal. You know, let's maybe if they make it past the first round." Well, the la- last year we underachieved in that we didn't get a playoff series. Right. Mm-hmm. This year we underachieved in that we got one playoff win and got knocked out in five and, games by and, a lower seed. And you had home court advantage. Yeah, that's a disappointment. And that's a clear-cut disappointment. And I'm not going to give them a consolation prize for 50 wins in the regular season. It's a milestone. It's nice. But I don't care. Right. I don't care. I. This league, every league, is about what you do once the regular season is over. Half the damn league makes the playoffs. I'm not going to wave a banner because I'm in the top half of the league. Right. And so next year... If you don't win two playoff series and you don't make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, to me, it's a third straight collapse. It's a third straight underachievement. Because you know the other shoe is dropping. You know, you know, you know, you have a very slim chance of signing Donovan Mitchell, and then you're back. Not if you make it to the finals. If, I think if, if you, they if make, you, it if the you finals, make it to the finals, and they and they lose maybe in the Eastern Conference Finals in seven games, and they're right there, then I think you got a chance of Donovan sitting down saying, "Let's talk." Well, that's why I'm like. 12 years or 12 months is a lifetime. It is. In the a lot NBA. can change. A lot can change between now and a year from now. We have no idea how this is going to play out. Yeah. I, I would have felt like a, a first round win would have been success this yeah. year for the Cavs. I wouldn't have gone conference finals just because the East is so loaded. I didn't necessarily expect them to make that. But, and I'm not ready to say what next year needs to look like because we still have a whole offseason of free agency sure. and everything else and see who's healthy, what teams stay together, who disassembles. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, the bar has been raised now for the Cavs, and, and just 50 wins isn't good enough. Just making the playoffs isn't good enough. Not when you have the talent you've assembled. And, and I, I think it's just a little bit different. And, you know, you talk about – and Kobe mentioned, like, the four. We have to rely on, on those four guys. Well, when you look at, like, what Miami did – when, when they brought together their stars, they brought together three Hall of Fame talents. It wasn't just really good players or p- young players. It was guys in their seventh year who played seven years going into their eighth years in uh, Wade, LeBron, and Bosh. So you could be really top-heavy with those three, and you could get by with league minimum guys at the bottom of sure. the roster because you knew you had three Hall of Famers to carry you. Cavs aren't in that position with no. these four. They're really good players. But they're not at the level of a big three type of what we're accustomed no. to seeing. They could grow into that. But, you know, I mean, these guys are – Evan's going into year three, not year eight. Darius is going into year, what, five, not year eight. Donovan is that guy. He should be in that guy. But even he's not in that mold of LeBron and Dwayne Wade. He's a really good player. Right. But he's not greatest of all time conversation, at least it, not yet. You know, I know that you can parse whether or not a trip to the finals is what was expected, but I can tell you this, and you don't know how this is going to play out, but if you would have told me coming into the playoffs that Milwaukee's going to be a first round bounce, Mm -hmm. I would have been salivating. I would have said, Oh, then we've got a pretty clear path. We have to beat two teams that were seated below us to get to the Eastern conference finals. Now you either have to see one of either Boston or Philly. Right. And, and so now that's a dual, you know, that doesn't seem like such a Herculean task. But you couldn't even get out of the gate with step one. Right. And I, it, it, Milwaukee season was a far bigger bust than the Cavs. Yes. But for me, this this Cavs season was a bust. We got 15 minutes, not quite. We got 10 minutes, minutes for Guardians. 10 we minutes, got five Guardians, minutes at five the minutes end. viewer yes. comments. Go. Guardians lose to Boston 7 1 yesterday. Yeah. I was excited with what Logan Allen gave them. Five mm-hmm. strong innings, gave up two runs. He My struck job. out eight. Eight again, I, 16 and two starts. He's now. that guy. Yeah. I, th- I think he's the guy that we thought he was going to be. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on what Logan Allen has been so far? Like the young pup. I, I like what he what he's brought. And he he wasn't even one of the, the tippy top prospects. But that's the thing about the Guardians. They always get if, if they bring you up, you 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 got something. I like the fact that and it's just so sad that he pitched that well, gave up two earned runs, you know, only four hits. Um, struck out eight. I think he struck out eight the last game, and it sucks because you. I, it was one of those games where you could just tell these bats is not going to do nothing. Like now, I thought that early. Saturday, and they mount a rally and they tie the game, and then here comes Classe, and Classe looked horrible. Yeah, yeah. He, he didn't he, record an out, and he, they lose the game in extra innings after scoring in the top of the 10th. That, to me, was the gut punch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no. Logan Allen is is the guy, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's his his stuff is not overpowering. He's no. not in that 
Bybee, Gavin Williams, Espino level of type of prospect where their stuff, they're throwing 98, 99. He's not throwing that hard. I do think they're going to get a book out on him. He is going to get hit, and then he's going to have to see how he adjusts from there. So I'm not ready to declare him as the guy, but he's off to a great start. You can't dispute with what he's doing. I'm just curious when teams get a little bit more tape on him and when they see his sequences, when they see his stuff, uh, he is going to get hit a little bit just because he's not overpowering and dominating, I don't think. The lineup, you know, it's May 1st. It's frustrating to watch, but I don't think – I do think guys are going to come around as the weather warms. Bats should heat up a little bit. They'll make some sort of move at the deadline. You know, we've talked about it before. Bull and I have gone around and around. I think they probably will add a right-handed bat at the deadline if Naylor can't figure it out by then. Naylor just looks terrible. Tito had Naylor hitting uh, in a game late last week against lefties, one-run game late. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. When he didn't call for a pinch hitter, I go, well, here comes a strikeout. And and I think I think he would tell you if he's being honest, well, it's April, and we want to give him those opportunities right now. But, but don't we know what he is against lefties? Yes and no. I mean, he hasn't shown anything, and, and, and Bull and I have argued about this at length. Mm-hmm. No, he hasn't shown the ability to hit lefties, but I'm not ready to give up on him but I'm getting pretty darn close. It's just, he's, it feels he, like he's just a platoon guy I mean, and you've got to have, you got to be able to put the bat on the ball. You got to be able to right, do something right. against lefties. And it's, and, and I thought Zach Meisel put this really well. I was talking to Zach about it. And Zach's like, once you close that door, you can, you don't really reopen it. Once you declare, no, then he'd have to be moved to another team that might try again. Yeah. Once you declare you can't hit lefties. Well, now you've just declared and you can't, go back on that and now it's yeah a full-time but you know what platoon. give him a chance i just hated that it was a pressure situation every win is going to be gold in yeah. this in this division and i i it was i knew what was coming before it happened we should never know that he just hasn't been able to do it now look if he turns it around and suddenly can hit lefties it's going to be one of the very few times that that's happened the body of work is big enough we've seen it we know what it is he just cannot hit left-handed pitching. And at the rate we're going, I think in July you'll see a trade for a right-handed bat. And, I would and hope bring, so. They'll bring some. I would uh, hope so. You know, the Twins aren't really running away with it, but I, I think they got to keep it close. You, I don't think they can get get down seven, eight, eight games in the division. To I that point, they've lost four straight series. They've lost six of their last seven series, and they're at Yankee Stadium beginning tonight. So it could easily be five straight series losses, seven of eight series losses. They're currently 13 and 15. They're only three and a half behind the Twins yeah. because the Twins aren't, you know, right. a juggernaut. They're not running away with anything yet, but it gets late pretty early. And, and they've you got, can't let that grow to seven or eight no. games in May. No, you and, you got, and you got a series with Minnesota coming up right after the Yankees. So you do. that should be an opportunity. <laughs> Hopefully you can make it, but, but that can go either <laughs> way. Right. 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 And, and you, the way they've been going, it's not been good. To me, I'm not ready to panic. Uh, I'm certainly discouraged with what I've seen, but it's only two games under 500, and I think it was you that asked me, okay, let's split the season into thirds. What do you expect when they're a third of the way through, Mm -hmm. which would roughly be about 50 games? I said I expect them to be around 500 because they're doing all this without their number two arm. Once they get McKenzie back, and by the way, do you have anything on that when he's expected back? When it, right around when he's active or eligible to come off the sixty, which when would it, be June, right? When it's hot end outside. of this month, end okay. of May, yeah, very end of this month. Yeah, he well, be we're going to need him, and then it, you know, what do I expect in the second, third of the season? I expect them to go six or seven games over five hundred in that stretch because now they've got their arms figured out. Is Plezak the guy? I don't think so. No. Uh, is Savali the guy? He can be sometimes, he's but he's, stay a, healthy. he's maybe a fourth or a fifth starter. Yeah. Quantrill has been, you know, a, a little, all over the place. I don't know who he is yet. He's pitching tonight against the Yankees, I know we're which find out. him in the past. Yeah, I know. We're going to find out more about him tonight, but it, I'm not panicking. But here is the red flag that definitely has me concerned. You have 17 home runs in 28 games. Yeah. That 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 is not going to do it. That That's not even going to come close. There are guys that have as many home runs in one day as the Guardians' leading home run hitter has all season. Yeah. It is it is a code red, all sirens are blaring, and I don't know where it's going to come from. I mean, Jose is going to get hot, you would think, but three home runs in the first month of the season? Uh, that ain't it. Are you worried about him? No. I'm not worried that Jose is going to put together a good year. I don't think he's going to duplicate He's not going to be an MVP candidate. I mean, I don't know how he can be when you have a month of April as as slow as his has been. And I don't know what the answer to it is. 
I don't know. I'm, I'm not at all worried about Jose. I think his numbers at the end of the year will be right where we expect him to be, especially with the new format and, and them taking away the shift. If he has three a month, he, he finishes with 18 home runs. Uh, he'll, he'll have more than that. I know he'll have more than that, and I'm, I'm not – but, like, is Josh Bell – who is Josh Bell going to end up I don't, I don't know about him. I'm worried it's, about what they paid him. The, the Guardians are a team that when they do make a free agent move like that, they can't miss. Right. They're not the Yankees, and they can't spend their way out of mistakes. Well, luckily, this is a one-year deal, one year and an option year. Yep. So, it's not – if he is a miss, it's not the end of the world. You it's not on. like you're locked in for five or six years. Yeah, I wish they would have done more. Um, and I don't know what the answer is. Um we talked at length, will these guys come back and have the same success in year two that they have in year one? Quan hasn't been the same guy. Oscar Gonzalez hasn't been the same guy. No, Gonzalez. We're seeing oh, the wow. dreaded sophomore right. slump that we talked about and that right. I was very worried about all along. Yeah. Will Brennan's a guy that I really like. Yeah. I mean, Brennan has MVP. played well. But, MVP. You know, you still got to – you got to get what you expect out of these other guys, and so far it just hasn't been there. Yeah, I think- I'll wait it out too. I, you know, I, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm. My knees are very stable until uh, Memorial Day. Them going off. Okay, so knee jerk <laughs> at June first. Like June first, Mike. Listen, you told me I couldn't say nothing. <laughs> I waited you out till right. June first. We've got five minutes left. We want to hear what some of the viewers were saying yes. about the draft. So yeah, two things real quick. One, there's no call of grace support today because the race was apparently delayed so we'll have that tomorrow they're racing today we love our friends over at colic and we're gonna read some internet comments on the draft from our youtube community page and it is brought to us as always by pcc air force if you're looking for a job with career advancement and great benefits well pcc airfoils is the place for you they are looking to hire jobs that start paying at 18 dollars and up and they have locations in east lake menor wickliffe and minerva if you want full benefit packages paid time off and signing bonuses you can apply online at precast dot com slash careers to learn more so over the weekend we posted on our community tab on youtube every pick some stats a little analysis on them i'm going to read a comment or two on uh, five or six of these real quick we'll go through and just show the the fact that no one could agree on anything let's just put it that good pick bad pick no one knows the first one is on cedric tillman this from comes from kelly bale look at those tillman numbers dot 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 he had those in only five starts Future stud in all capitals. <laughs> and right under that is Mikey McCray. <laughs> Terrible pick. We have enough bad and mediocre receivers like Schwartz and Bell at best. He's Donovan Peoples Jones and DPJ, not even that good. <laughs> We're going to go next to Can't DeWan Jones and our YouTube along. page and our YouTube comments. <laughs> Joel Joss, it just hit me. 6'8, that's flipped out. Biggest person ever. The Bellonian, the dude is a mountain. And then Hades Underworld says, future bus, book it. <laughs> Next, Isaiah McGuire out of Missouri. Draft experts. <laughs> they bored Ian, on fire. I'm all for more defensive line depth. Can't wait to go to Bleacher Report and see Erm, still no linebacker. I've never seen Erm in writing. Erm, still no linebackers on the Browns page. <laughs> Chad Fraser says, dude, no linebackers. We need linebackers. Linebackers, linebackers, linebackers. And then Vic's former 44 says, we may have the worst linebacker in NFL history, but this is a good edge rusher pick. So they'll agree on that. <laughs> and then we'll get to the quarterback. This is from uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson. He was their fifth round pick. Uh, let me read a couple here. The real RMP. Terrible pick. Why are you drafting a quarterback when there's still other needs on the team? And we also had only one Zay saying, How the hell did he fall this far? DTR is a stud. Great pick. Could be the backup <laughs> for five, six, seven years. I love it. Bro. So essentially, the conclusion of this little project is We're everywhere. Who knows? <laughs> who and knows? You know what? And real quick, I skipped the one on uh, Siaki Ika. Let me let me pull up his real quick. We got twenty comments on that. Uh, Mikey McRae also commented on this one. Says, "Goodness, the last D tackle we drafted from Baylor was Phil Taylor from Baylor." You're gonna say Baylor twice in the same sentence. Awesome. Uh, Bill Graper says, "I've never heard of him, but looks like he's a big guy with great range." Fills a huge need. And then on the other side. Danny Show says, dude is just flat out not good. Wears down very easily. So, at the end of the day, I think this shows what we all knew. That nobody knows anything. These nobody dudes might knows. be great. These dudes might be terrible. And we're not going to yeah. see until they actually step on the field. So, just like us, it turns out that our YouTube commenters don't, don't know. They don't, just don't, like don't know. know. And you know what? The, the, the one thing I can say about the NFL draft with certainty after watching it as a fan and covering it in the media for years now, um, no one knows. For every Peyton Manning, there's a Ryan Leaf. Mm-hmm. 
for every first round bust, there's uh, Brock Purdy. For every first rounder that flames out, there's an undrafted free agent that makes the team. It's not a science. We try to make it a science. We measure, we poke, we prod, we ask. We try to do all of the due diligence in the world. And sometimes you just Johnny Manziel it. You just, you just miss. And other times you put your foot in it and you get lucky. I have decided that all of everything I saw over the weekend means nothing to me. The only thing that matters is what they do from here on out. That's it. And once you kind of come to that realization, the draft just becomes noise. Yeah. Yeah. It just becomes thi- a thing that is a necessary evil that we have to go through. But we're not going to know. And we may not know for three years. We, d- we still don't know about guys that dra- Browns drafted three years ago. We're, we're still saying that. I don't know. Yeah. We're going to do it later this week. We're going to grade Andrew Berry's first draft class later this week. It takes three years. We'll see you in overtime. Come on, Peace. Peace.